Welcome to ECU in the School of Arts and Humanities. My name is Clyde Barstow and I'm uh, Executive Dean of Arts and Humanities here at ECU. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Noongar, Wujuk, Elgar's people, past, present and emerging. Um, I'm very proud to host this conference. Issues of mental health have been around a long time and it's taken a pandemic, really, for us to take seriously this issue about mental health in society. And artists deal with mental health in particular ways, not just in terms of healing other people, but also dealing with their own mental health in some cases. So this is a, a timely conference, but I think a really interesting conference. Um, I'd like to thank Ted and the National Art School and everybody that's been involved in setting up this project, both the exhibitions and the conference. As I say, it's, it's very timely. And purely coincidentally, I was just talking to Ted about this this morning, uh, the DDCA um, have a, a monthly journal called Nitro, and it, that dropped today, actually. And the theme of that is mental health and the arts, and it's purely coincidental, actually. Um, so if any of you want to look at some extra reading, then if you go onto the DDCA website and hit Nitro, there are a whole load of papers there from artists and designers from across the country discussing this issue about mental health and the arts. So uh, thank you for all being here today. Uh, welcome to all of you. And I'd like to now hand over to Ted. Thank you. Oh, sorry, housekeeping. That's why I'm here. I've just realized. <laughs> um, housekeeping. Toilets. This is the most important thing. Toilets are just out here. Um, the architect decided to camouflage the doors so that nobody can find them. Um, so if you can't find the toilets, there are toilets in all of the buildings around here. So good luck with that one. Um, if we have a fire, then obviously we have a fire exit here and here. Um, I think you can work out that if the fire is there, you run this way, uh, vice versa. So, um, and then finally, if you could just turn your mobiles off while the conference is on, that would be great. Thank you. Ted. Thank you, Clive. And I would like to acknowledge my co-convener, Lyndall Adams, who uh, has put this project together. Um, and has been absolutely vital in making sure that it all worked well. Thank you. Well, good morning. We meet today on Wajak Noongar land, and I acknowledge also the Wajak Noongar people and their ancestors as the original owners and the spiritual and cultural custodians of this country. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Everybody has a dark side, a place of fear and dread they go to voluntarily or not. And managing that part of our lives is crucial to health and well-being, a fact that's been highlighted by our recent experiences of COVID-19. However, there is a model of managing that dark side productively that has been provided by artists over the centuries. Artists have confronted their dark side and made sense of their world through their creative practice. This may be through an examination of the external world or an interrogation of their internal narratives. And it is often done in tandem in an attempt to find balance or indeed to restore balance in their lives. The Dark Side exhibition and the broader program of the Frame of Mind project, of which it is a part, showcases how a group of local artists have successfully managed that aspect of their lives in a way that has both personal benefits while also providing a model of practice for the wider community. This is the premise of the Frame of Mind project, as so cogently outlined by Professor Ian Hickey. It's time, he says, that we actively promoted the true social value of the creative arts sector and, in particular, its unique contribution to our national mental health. Those of us in universities and working with emerging artists are aware of the need to offer guidance and support to young professionals building their careers. But, equally, it is the case that artists can offer a model of practice that can assist the wider society as it too struggles with these issues. Managing your dark side requires self-awareness, courage and resilience. It is not 
without its dangers. Yet artists have always worked in that penumbral space, on the cusp between dark and light, so vividly depicted in this painting by Ross Seaton, the master of Nedlands. Ross lived a long life and created an extraordinary body of work that acknowledged this duality in his life and the risks it presented to others. Now in this lecture, I want to explore the relationship that artists have with their dark side and the ways they engage with it to make sense of their world, to find solace, to take control, and by confronting their fears and then externalising them in artworks, to mark out a space in the world for themselves. This image by the English artist Ken Kiff, called Talking with a Psychiatrist, Psychoanal Psychoanalyst, Night Sky, created over a period from 1975 to 1980, provides one way in which artists engage their dark side. Kiff did indeed visit a psychoanalyst and took along all the monsters and fears that constantly accompanied him, seen here lurking behind, just like Taryn Gill's tricksters. Yet in the room, the dark and dangerous presence is not those accompanying figures bathed in light, but the dark looming figure of the doctor, shrouded in shadows. In contrast, the artist seems calm, even comfortable, in the presence of his demons. The tools of the psychiatrist's trade, hammer, chisel, saw and pitchfork, he's not very subtle, our kin, are discarded on the floor. They are of no use. It is the artist who will find a way to accommodate these companions, to make sense of their presence in his life, and to use them productively as sources for his work. Kiff's painting, like the creative practice of many artists, is a mechanism that allows internal narratives to unfold and find some resolution in the controlled environment of the studio. The studio, however that is defined in the 21st century, and there's lots of variations, has been mythologised as a place of tantalising mystery, of transgression, of wild imaginings, and not infrequently as the site of wanton licentiousness. Although essentially a workshop, the artist's studio has become the focus of individual creativity and the eye of the inspirational maelstrom. In that sense, it is both a catalyst and an incubator of new ideas born out of turmoil and hardship. It has become inextricably linked to the notion of the absolute authority of the individual creator. Within their walls, a battle ensures each day, undertaken by thousands of committed individuals, working alone, but with shared goals that embrace the whole of society. Every artist establishes their studio as one of their most significant creative acts. They select it with great care, then they set it up to provide as much comfort, solace and seclusion as necessary. It is their idiosyncratic creation, and in that sense, each studio is a kind of self-portrait, a mirror of individual working habits and private rituals. It is also a lens that brings disparate thoughts into focus. In a world in which so much else is under the sway of external forces, the practice of art making in the studio remain, remains singularly the practitioner's domain. The artist has ultimate control over the outcome, and taking control is then one of the fundamental benefits of creating artworks. This security and groundedness enable artists to share their insights and fortuitously to provide reassurance to us all. A great social benefit is that the work they create in their studios offers us all a safe place to confront our collective conscious concerns, fears and anxieties. Now, I want to make clear that I am not a psychologist. That is the domain of our speaker this afternoon, Professor Joanne Dixon. Nor am I an art therapist. I am an art historian. And in that sense, I will be hoping to provide some insights into the creative process and the ways in which we interpret the artworks that are its products. I do not underestimate the severe mental illness or the severe impact of mental illness, or am I suggesting 
that the arts are a panacea. In this lecture, I merely want to stress the therapeutic benefit of engagement with the arts as a tool to, to nurture well-being and to document how artists across the centuries, including those participating in the dark side, have engaged their dark side as an engine to generate aspects of their practice. The artworks I have selected to illustrate this lecture are drawn from many sources, and I hope they illustrate the points that I am making. However, I make no assumptions, nor do I proffer any diagnosis of the individual artist's mental health, unless clear evidence exists or acknowledgement of certain medical conditions are made by those individuals. That said, the image of the tormented artists exploding their anxiety and frustrations onto a canvas has become the default image of creative genius. As depicted by Julian Schnabel in the film At Eternity's Gate, Vincent van Gogh, played with manic glee by Willem Dafoe, is shown painting olive trees in a fit of dervish hallucination. He spins around, almost frothing at the mouth, as if this lack of control signifies authentic, meaningful expression. The mythologizing of the mad artist is particularly associated with Vincent mutilating his ear, following a fight with the artist Paul Gauguin, and then sending the excised lobe to Gabrielle Berlatier, a maid in a local brothel. His chronicling of the incident's aftermath in self-portrait with, with bandaged ear and self-portrait with bandaged ear and pipe, both painted in 1889, has helped cement the now legendary incident as a prime example of mental instability and artistic genius. But those two self-portraits are an enigma, as you can see. The piercing stare and visible injury suggest great pain, but the carefully applied paint strokes and clearly outlined forms suggest an artist in control of his medium, depicting his experience with sensitivity, nuance and empathy. This is not the work of a crazed man who has lost control, but a thoughtful, skilled artist reflecting on his life experiences. Even his most famous painting, made before he either committed suicide or was shot by two young hoons, depending on which version of Vincent's death that you ascribe to, Schnabel goes for the young hoons playing with a revolver and taunting the poor man who was accidentally shot. Anyway, however you take that, this painting is a remarkably well-controlled and well-constructed painting that is anything but a chaotic emotional dump. However, some artists were, of course, certifiably mentally ill. Richard Dadd, for example. A talented youth, Dadd was accepted into the Royal Academy when, he, Academy when he was only 20. And then, while on a trip to the Middle East, he began hearing voices, most often the Egyptian god Osiris. When Dadd returned to London, he was diagnosed as non compus mentis, and it was suggested that he be institutionalised. Unfortunately for his father, Dad convinced him that he just needed a break in the country. And when they reached the small village of Cobham, Osiris once again spoke to him, urging him to kill the devil who had taken the form of his poor father. I'm sure we can all sympathise with Dad and his unfortunate name for a man who ended up committing patricide. He was diagnosed with dementia praecox, which we would now call paranoid schizophrenia, and he was sent to Bedlam to St Mary's Hospital. Thankfully, the hospital authorities granted him access to art materials and his own studio, and when he was at Broadmoor. With little else to occupy his time, he was extremely productive. From his cell in Bedlam and the studio in Broadmoor, he continued to work on his wonderful fantasy images, such as this painting of Oberon and Titania, full of fairies and Shakespearean references. And he also painted portraits of his doctors, this is his leading physician, and the other inmates at the asylum, including his extraordinary portrait of one of the inmates, Crazy Jane. All of these were done with meticulous care and formidable skill. They are not the works of a crazed lunatic. While at Broadmoor, he produced his most famous work, The Fairy Feller's Masterstroke, 
which he painted over several decades. As we can see from his extraordinary oeuvre, his mental illness was only one of many influences on his work. It is therefore unfortunate that the epithet Mad Richard has been so often appended to his name. His skill, the solitude provided by Bedlam and Broadmoor, and his ability to mine the dark side of his psyche enabled him to create an extraordinary body of work. And just as a note of reference, the Japanese artist Yayoi Kusama has also lived in an institution for the past 25 years, and she has found it a very conducive place to continue working. Not surprisingly, she's achieved an extremely high level of productivity. For Dad, Kusama, and for many other artists, acknowledging their dark side is a key to developing their practice. The Norwegian artist Edvard Munch confessed in his diary that my fear of life is necessary as my illness. They are indistinguishable from me and their destruction would destroy my life. Munch, uh, my art. Munch understood that the dark side is a counterbalance in life and provides the richness and complexity that defines us as individual human beings. His painting, The Sick Child, was generated from the experience of confronting the death of his sister Sophie from tuberculosis when he was just 14 years old. He used his deeply personal experiences of mental anguish to create an artwork suggestive of collective suffering. The way in which Munch dealt with this trauma is indicative of the ways in which artists can contribute to broader societal health and well-being. Through this work, an image that he returned to many times throughout his life, we are able to empathise and so confront the pain in our own lives. Indeed, his paintings have now become synonymous with human frailty, with pain and with our sense of anxiety. However, interestingly, the most famous work, The Scream, was not initially prompted by existentialist fear and anguish. Instead, it was titled The Scream of Nature and was his response to the extraordinary sunsets that resulted from the eruption of the volcano Krakatoa in Indonesia in 1883, which threw so much dust and rock and detritus into the stratosphere that the sky turned red at the close of each day for many, many months. It was clearly an important and potent image for the artist, and Munch returned to it over the next 20 years, up until 1917. The isolated figure on the bridge, contorted and emitting a cry of pain that is internally audible to us all when we look at this work, seems to speak for all human suffering. Not surprisingly then, it has indeed become synonymous with human anguish, with suffering, and undoubtedly because it's something we can all relate to, empathise with, and recognise within ourselves. In a similar response to Munch's, when offered the opportunity to undertake psychiatric counselling, the German poet Rainer Marie Rilke reputedly protested, saying, don't take away my devils, because my angels might flee too. As Professor K. Redfield Jamison has explained in an article in Scientific American, depression may simply be the flip side of the creative manic state, the price artists pay for their bouts of productive work. The manic depressive state is, in a biological sense, an alert sensitive warning system that reacts strongly and swiftly. It responds to the world with a wide range of emotional, perceptual, intellectual, behavioural and energy changes. For all artists, maintaining that balance, recognising their dark side and using it to create no new work is both an act of taking control and of confronting their fears when they are externalised into artworks. The process of confronting the dark side is admittedly both painful and productive, but the romantic myth of artists as ordained seers living outside the constraints of human society is actually misleading. Visual artists are locked into their communities. They have the same experience as others in their community. However, their studio is a safe place when external pressures have the potential to overwhelm, and most importantly, where they can harness the dark side as an incubator for ways to manage and to find solace. Once again, Ken Kiff has created an image of glowing self-recognition and peace 
that epitomises one of the benefits of engaging with the arts in a world that is increasingly stressful. The World Health Organisation has reported that anxiety and depression is expected to become the world's most burdensome disease by 2020. That's now. More than 264 million people of all ages suffer from depression, a leading cause of disability worldwide. One in three Australians aged 16 to 85 has experienced some form of mental illness, dramatically exacerbated by the isolation and dislocation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Significantly, anxiety and depression have impacted Aboriginal communities with the horrific figure that suicide in the Kimberley, which was non-existent before the 1960s, has now doubled every decade. And perhaps the most distressing is the fact that suicide is now the leading cause of death for Indigenous children aged between 5 and 17. 5 and 17. As I stated at the beginning of this lecture, I'm not a psychologist nor an art therapist, but this information is extremely dist distressing. And while therapeutic and medical treatments are widely employed, sometimes we have to admit with dangerous side effects, there is an increasing body of research globally that documents the beneficial impact of the arts in promoting health and well-being at both an individual and a societal level. While practising the arts is clearly no panacea, as I said, or mental health concerns, there is evidence to support engagement with the arts is an effective way of promoting well-being. The field of art therapy has established the efficacy of art-based techniques as positive interventions for medical health in, uh, issues, such as anxiety and depression. Indeed, there is further evidence that the arts can be used in non-therapy contexts for promoting mental health, such as the arts to foster better learning in primary and high schools, which brings the additional benefit of also managing mental and emotional well-being. So it is somewhat surprising that we're seeing less engagement with the arts in our upper primary and secondary educational systems. It sometimes seems that art is included in the school curriculum because it makes the day a little bit more pleasant and fills in those awkward gaps in the timetable. Despite the fact that research shows engagement with the visual arts contributes an essential component to the healthy, well-adapted, to the development of healthy, well-adapted members of our community. Earlier in our education system, making art, dancing and singing are central and critical components of kindergarten and early primary education. Of course, because it's fun, but also because we learn by doing. We learn kinesthetically, we learn by repetition. We remember when we combine our senses and focus all our abilities on a specific problem. These are the skills that enable us to deal with the difficult issues in our lives and find a balance that promotes well-being. The role of art and health at healing within Indigenous communities provides another excellent model of engagement. Rather than being seen as separate activities, art is integrated into all aspects of Indigenous life. The value of any artwork is judged by its social and religious significance in the life of the community, and not only for its visual appeal. Healers within those Indigenous communities are viewed in a similar way. To be a healer demands a level of respect, but it is not necessarily considered an independent occupation. To be a healer, or to be an artist, is to be actively involved in maintaining the health and well-being of the community. These works that I'm showing by Eubena, by Boxer Milner, Paddy Bedford and Nyakul Dawson reflect the relationship between traditional indigenous healing techniques and art practices within communities across the western half of Western Australia. Indeed, any artists are, any artists are also traditional healers. Many artists are traditional healers. The idea of well-being, as outlined in the Geneva Declaration of the Health and Survival of Indigenous Peoples, affirms that cultural identity and expression is essential to a people's well-being. It connects Indigenous health and resilience with rights to express relationships to land, reciprocal justice, family and kinship ties, st language, stories, writings, art, theatre, music, dance and games. As such, the relationship between art, health and well-being within Indigenous communities is inextricably linked to the notion of country. 
This spiritual link with the land lies at the core of cultural identity and offers a sense of well-being and of identity. The results of this well-being are reflected in artworks that also demonstrate how integral it is to developing a notion of self-identity. Within the field of neuroaesthetics, researchers have used biofeedback to study the effects of visual arts on neural circuits and neuroendocrine markers to establish biological evidence that engagement with the visual arts promotes health, wellness, and fosters adaptive responses to stress by reducing cortisol levels, which are one of the markers indicating levels of stress. Neuroaesthetics uses brain imaging, brain wave technology, and biofeedback to gather evidence of how we respond to the arts. Through this research, there is now verifiable evidence that the arts engage the mind in novel ways. They tap into emotions in healthy ways, and they make us feel good. Yet, as previously stated, there is little evidence of this research impacting on the curriculum, sadly, in our primary schools. An extremely important aspect of practicing the visual arts is the impact it has on mindfulness. Because it accesses and engages different parts of the brain, through conscious shifting of, of, of mental states. As practitioners, it is something we are aware of as we shift in and out of various fields of thought, creating a cognitive shift into a holistic state of mind called flow, a state of optimal engagement that is mentally pleasurable and neurochemically rewarding. There are many studies on the relationship between the arts, flow, and mental health. Flow-like states have been connected to mindfulness, attention, creativity, and even improved cognition. Hence, a benefit to all the community at whatever level of engagement. Clearly, there is a great deal more that we can do to assist our community by proselytising the benefits of engagement with the arts, both as practitioners, most effectively, but also as consumers of the arts in all its multifarious forms. Opportunities exist to radically impact on this spreading nightmare for many in our community. The evidence of global research shows that engagement with the arts aids in self-discovery, acknowledging and recognising feelings that are lurking in our subconscious. Improved self-esteem, giving a feeling of self-accomplishment. Emotional release, providing an outlet for expressing and letting go of negative feelings and fears. This extraordinary portrait of the Russian revolutionary poet Vladimir Mayakovsky by Ken Kiff brilliantly captures the frustration and pain that led to his suicide while simultaneously acting as an example of how to purge distressing thoughts through painting. Though on a matter of historical accuracy, Mayakovsky shot himself in the chest. And stress release. In all these areas, artists provide an exemplary model of practical, struct structural engagement with their dark side. In various ways, the artists in the Dark Side exhibition engage their dark side to manage and understand their world. For Sharon Egan, the memory of being taken from her family and treated like dogs was a catalyst for recreating the small baby she and her friends made from sardine cans, scraps of fabric, gravel, and whatever else was on hand. As Sharon explains, although we didn't have role models about how to love, we had love to give. And we expressed that in the great pleasure we had in making dolls. Her creativity is both a way of making sense of the nightmare that she was experiencing, while simultaneously moving beyond and taking control of her life. The safe space that art making provides is a solace and a coping mechanism. As Taryn Gill explains, I am inspired by Jung's active imagination process, using making as a bridge between the conscious and the unconscious. Through Feldenkrais, I learn to meet myself through movement awareness. I carry this into the studio, meeting myself through art making. The rhythm of making art is a part of this process. Art takes time, and Taryn Gill's work is laborious, absorbing, and provides time to reflect productively. Taking time to address these issues is at the core of all artists' practice. The solitude of the studio, 
of a room of one's own, as Virginia Woolf described it, is fundamental to achieving well-being. Similarly, for Tyrone Wegana, who's in the audience, hi Tyrone, a nice peace place to hate yourself is about finding a place you can forget about yourself and all your problems. Painting is a way, he explains, to escape a little bit. And I think it's a way to deal with things as well. It's kind of meditative. So when you are feeling a bit overwhelmed, you can paint and express yourself and just escape from being. These artists believe that by making art, it is possible to engage fully with the world and sometimes to escape from it. Indeed, this is one of the most powerful motivating forces for many artists when embracing a career in the arts. The challenge is to establish a point of equilibrium. As Max Richter says, music enables me to live my life. Facing a, a distressing situation can be traumatic. This anxiety induces, has ramifications. So finding a way to accommodate these feelings of rejection, sorrow and anguish is part of the healing process. For Carla Adams, who's also in the audience, her experience on Tinder could have been devastating. Reports of the impact of social media on health and well-being are well documented. Yet Adams has taken those experiences to powerfully confront the vicious scarring effects as she describes them. Her weavings are portraits that, in her words, allow plenty of time for the crafting of a narrative of the subject outside of the fleeting online encounter. Perhaps he plays tennis. Maybe he has a collection of cactuses. I think he might be allergic to peanuts. By doing this, the works become a kind of Dear John letter. I know we never really knew each other, but I want you to know that I'm over you and I forgive you. Forgiveness, as for Sharon Egan, is another fundamental skill achieved through the creative practice. Of course, COVID-19 has exacerbated many of these traumas, as Lyndall and Nicola, who are in the audience, Stephen Terry and Marcella Hollein have discovered. Addressing them with a collective art project has enabled the creation of concretized memory, linking words of rebuff, frustration and abuse with images of introduced weeds has enabled them to claim their territory and, once again, take control. Death and desire remains a constant in our lives. The 21st century has magnified many of our responses, exposing our, fra our frailty in ways that we could never have imagined. Darcy Code, also in the audience, Darcy's uh, collages have become a way to jam opposing worlds together to create a point of intrigue. The sedate deathliness into something obscure, obscurely glamorous that teases the senses, confronting death as something comical, cathartic, and also seductive, he explains. In a similar way, Mary Moore contemplates the tragic death of her beloved sister, using drawing as a way of linking my external world with my interior life. They are about ideas that I was unable to communicate in any other way. Putting ideas out into the world Externalising the pain, fear and distress is a powerful tool in making sense of an impossibly difficult situation and of moving on. Like many young men, Roderick Sprigg behaved in ways that, on reflection, were terrifying and distressing. His paintings of car crashes recount moments in time when fear, exhilaration, success and failure all met. I recall the burst of adrenaline and upper disappointment in my stupidity played out in an explosion of blurs and technicolour hyperfocus. He says, I still recite some of these memories with all my mates when we catch up and wonder how we are still alive, he explains. However, there are other memories that remain moot, mute. While never in total control, having the ability to juxtapose the catalogue of fears onto articulate narratives provides both solace and insight. Overwhelmed by the absurdity of life, we can feel disoriented and adrift, rather than being subsumed by this sense of alarm. Anna Natsari embraces her dark side as an otherworldly escape that provides a world of unimaginable exploration. Confounded by the enormity of problems such as climate change, she finds images from her personal experience that document the legacy and impact of anthropocentric behaviour. Like Goya, 
when confronting his deafness and the horror of war he encountered, the dark side becomes a source of imagery that offers a moment of release. As Robert Hughes explains when describing the black paintings, and in particular Goya's dog, the inscrutable dog's head, the lonely pooch gazing over the rim of the world, looking, one presumes, for its vanished master, as mankind might look for its vanished god. It is a picture of unassuageable sorrow and pathos. Also mining that dark side, Paul Ullman reimagines the darkness, but instead of being negative, Paul reconstructs these images of infinite darkness as symbolic of an endless process of forming and dissolving, of becoming. The Dark Side exhibition explored how 14 artists used their creative practice as a mechanism to comprehend their world. Through the experience of making art, they confront their fears and give external visual form to their existential musings. The process of delving deep, of spending time in the safe space of their studios, provides solace and insight that offers hope and fulfilment. It is not a place of retreat, but of acknowledgement and acceptance that gives direction and focus in an increasingly stressful world. It also showcases our humanity and, I think most importantly, our resilience in the face that forces that might otherwise destroy us. In conclusion, let me recap. Firstly, I want to reaffirm that I am not taking mental health lightly. There are many who suffer extreme pain and distress that requires medical intervention. The arts are no panacea. However, it is clear from the history of art that many artists have found ways of managing their dark side in ways that are extremely effective and indeed rewarding. Practical engagement with the visual arts, and while I'm focused on the area of creative practice that I know best, there's abundant research to include all forms of creative expression in this analysis. But the visual arts do, do contribute to individual well-being by providing the time to address most, powerfully and most powerful and distressing aspects of our lives. This engagement enhances our ability for self-discovery, to learn who we are and how we can assimilate and if, necessarily, if necessary, neutralise the dread, the suffering and the pain locked in our subconscious. Making images clearly induces greater self-esteem and offers each individual a feeling of accomplishment. The recognition of personal control and the ability to address what can be seen to be imponderable problems is a mechanism that generates self-awareness and well-being. The emotional release that is concomitant with this process is vital to growth through acceptance, resolution and forgiveness, as eloquently shown in the works of Sharon Egan, Carla Adams and Mary Moore. It is contingent on the relief of stress that the process of each creative practice engenders. When so much else in our increasingly frenetic lives seems beyond our control, the studio is the place where we can once again feel in charge and become the sole arbiters of what can be achieved, of what we can do to confront the dark side in our lives. And as previously stated, there's also verifiable community benefit in improving health and well-being, as several projects have shown. Arts and Minds is a leading in mental health, arts and mental health charity that has been running weekly art workshops for people experiencing depression, anxiety in Cambridgeshire for the past seven years. Led by an artist and a counsellor, its Arts on Prescription project offers a chance to work with a range of materials and techniques. The impact has been outstanding. As you can see, an evaluation revealed 71% decrease in feelings of anxiety, 73% fall in depression, 76% of the participants said that their well-being increased, and 69% felt they were more socially included. The arts are a way of forming, shaping and holding in front of your eyes something that you feel internally, said one participant. Making art and engaging with the work of artists is a powerful way of impacting on our own health and well-being, with the added benefit of offering solace, comfort and resolution for widespread feelings of anxiety and depression. The dark side is not something to be feared. It is a resource that can be mined as a way of dealing with those parts of our lives that have the potential 
to derail us, to send us into a downward spiral. With that knowledge, it is our responsibility as artists, as educators and as human beings to actively promote the arts as one of the ways in which our community can live happier, more complete and more productive lives. So please use this upcoming break to view the works of the courageous and generous artists whose work is on show next door in Gallery 25 and down the road at There Is to engage your dark side both productively and powerfully. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. It's good afternoon now, isn't it? Yes, just one minute. Um, I'm Nicola Kay, and it's with great pleasure that I'm the interlocutor for this first panel session today. And firstly, I would really like to extend, um, you know, my congratulations to Ted on a really stimulating and, and talk. Very critical points were raised, and the intention of this first panel is that we're going to pick up on some of those key ideas and then discuss them across the panel and also with all of you. And what Ted made very clear was how integral and significant the arts are for all of us. And here is testament to that. All of you sitting here, all of the artists, and certainly all of you that are online, welcome. So basically, I would like to, first of all, introduce the panel. I don't need to introduce Ted, you all know Ted. And I'll start over here with uh, Paul Ullman, Carla Adams, Anna Nazari, Darcy Codes, and myself. So the intention of this little session today is that each of the artists will have an opportunity to have a conversation, talk about their work, and then we're going to, I'll ask some questions based on Ted's talk, and also some points that Clive mentioned, both within the COVID realm, that of course continues to impact on all of us. And then following that, the panel might want to ask each other questions, we're just gonna see how we, we go, and then we'll open it up to the floor and online. So you'll all get an opportunity, hopefully, to ask some questions. And if not, you can always have a chat over lunch, which will happen at the end of this session. So without much further ado, I would like to first ask um, Paul to actually discuss the dark side and the way that it's you know, impacted upon him, how he's navigated it, the work that he's got in the show, and the contested space that, that Ted clearly pointed out that the dark side habits. So Paul, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nicola. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, it's a really uh, uh, great honour to be part of this exhibition and uh, this symposium. Um, I think this morning uh, Ted's uh, really laid down the groundwork really well for us. So a um, couple of things that I'd like to pick up on. Uh, one, I'd like to just briefly talk about uh, the work that I have in the show and then I'd also like to pick up on the studio that Ted mentioned. Um, uh, so I'll start with the studio, I think. Uh, uh, for me, the studio has always been an incredible space for um, uh, incredible, uh, intense uh, understandings, which is always, in my case, happening in a very uh, private space. I work in a studio on my own, and I have done now for many, many years. Um, but what I have found over the time of working there is there can be, uh, one sets up certain habits in the studio, certain ways of working, and gets used to those habits. And so when you're in that space of getting used to these habits that you're in entering into, you're entering into something else, a kind of a ritual space, I would say. Um, but I have experienced um, these moments where, for example, um, I'm in the process of making a painting and um, at the same time, I can hear a conversation happening downstairs on the street. I can visualize a car going by. I can uh, hear the music that's playing, and I'm having this kind of um, a hypersensual, hypersensitive hyper moment where I can, I'm part of so many different planes at once. And Deleuze would call this a plane of imminence, the philosopher Deleuze would call this a plane, a plane of imminence, where everything is collapsing and everything is in one space. Um, and at that moment, what I love about that is that the self, the ego, disappears, vanishes completely. And that, for me, is the kind of like a, 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 a moment I want to reach. So to just use that uh, together with the 
topic or the subject, uh, there's two birds in the painting called After Image in the show. And um, what I find is, in terms of my own life, um, I recognise that I live in this kind of hypercharged world where there are so many demands that are made upon me personally and then everybody I know. And, every, and the, the catchphrase is, everyone is so busy and it's so good to be so busy. And we have then this busy, anxiety-ridden world which we all seem to be buying into. Um, and anyway, so, but what I find is that there are certain moments in the everyday where, however, uh, you can transcend this experience, but have a moment of imminence where you connect to uh, the world, the field that you're part of, which is a wider field, which is around us all the time. And that can happen, uh, for example, when you see a bird moving past, you engage with that bird, something is held with, uh, within you with that after image, and then if you can hold on to that somehow and bring it back, uh, then it's almost like you've done something. There's some sort of healing. Thanks very much, Paul. <laughs> lots of food for thought there. This isn't working. I, I don't need a microphone anyway. Lo lo lots of food for thought there that we can pick up on. But um, Carla, I'd love to hear mm. your thoughts on how you've navigated this, this, this sort of space, this context. It is working? Oh, it's working now. So, um, Carla, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, I was just saying earlier today that um, I am of the age where I remember getting a home computer and the internet for the first time um, and that kind of coincided with me being a horny teenager which led to some disaster as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> so I think that um, my work has really just extended from that period of time. And um, I mean, I've told this story a million times, but I was uh, addicted to like a phone dating line in high school and I would sneak out of high school and, and um, to the pay phone over the road and dial and listen to all these messages that men had left me. And I think it's just progressed from there and just being seduced by um, this, this world of possibility and disaster and love and friendship and hate and all of those things that can happen in that realm. Um, so the works that I've got in this show uh, are responses to time spent on Tinder and in particular... Um, aggressive encounters or I guess just fleeting encounters that didn't go so well um, and the titles are in reference to things that were said to me on Tinder um, like I, am I allowed to do a swear yes <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't fuck you with my dad's dick said one guy I was like well lucky I'm not interested in your dad um, and so these are really a, a way for me to take those encounters that can be quite jarring oh my god like like that <laughs> um and just kind of sit with them a little bit and and the work is um labor intensive and can take a long time and uh like everyone's practice i suppose in in different ways but um yeah just sit with those feelings and those encounters and and like ted said um just maybe make them into something less powerful. Um, and they're a bit weird and they're a bit funny and they're a bit playful. Um, and often I take some liberties and make them look a bit goofier than they really are. Um, but yeah, I guess that's the, the uh, at the very center of the work is, is just forgiveness and that process of letting go, yeah. And you know, you raise really pertinent points there for me in regards to the dark side with this public and private space. Mm. You know, that way that the public and private space becomes increasingly blurred. And you know, this very private happenings that you have mm. experienced. Now, of course, as artists, that's what we do. We, we put it on show, but we curate what we show. You mm. know, but this public and private kind of nexus that we're in propelled even more so with COVID. You know, and I'm just thinking a conversation we just had about, you know, as artists, often our work, as Paul's just mentioned, is very much about in the studio, it's a very, usually very personal experience. And here we are discussing our work to an audience 
and also in this space in which increasingly, as I say, private and public is blurred. So I think your work really exemplifies that mm. in that sense. Do you feel that um, since COVID and this move online that it's had an impact in that sense? I, I guess because I deal with mostly dating apps which exist on the phone, which is like this little device that you is like pretty much always in your hand and um, I guess that world feels so personal and private because it's so close to you, it lives in your pocket, you can see yourself in this reflection of the screen. Um, but really, I mean, it's pretty public. The, nothing ever goes away from the internet, which is why I'm so glad I didn't go through art school when, like, <laughs> social media was around and yes. I didn't post all my terrible, like, first-year paintings. On <laughs> for the world to see forever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess because I've been working in a digital space for a long time, COVID, all COVID meant for me was more studio time, which was great. Um, and a lot of artists I know feel the same that way, you know. That's definitely shared, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, but thank you so much for that, Carla. I'm moving on to, to Anna. Anna, what about you? How are you navigating the dark side in your work? I think for me, I've always been a person that's been sort of quiet, <laughs> fairly reserved. I've, I've sort of found it sometimes hard to, you know, talk in public spaces and do that sort of stuff. And I think the art has really given me a voice. It's always been the space where I've been able to talk about issues that have affected me or um, explore things that I wouldn't normally be able to communicate. So I, I think it's, it's really just opened up a world of imagination for me and I, I sort of like, I really love sitting in that space. I, um, I was thinking about what um, Paul's talking about and thinking about how, f how often when I'm in that space, it's a very trance-like space. I just kind of get completely engulfed and, and taken away. And, and it's very healing as well. Like after a long day of work, I love to, you know, spend a few hours just doing and it, it really makes me feel just so much better. Um, in regard to the work, as, as Ted mentioned, it was sort of, looking at this legacy of climate change. And, um, and I've really been interested in a long time looking at relationships that humans have with animals. Um, I think with the, the uh, eyes, which are actually dolphin eyes, <laughs> I've, I've actually tried to make them um, human-like. Um, and they're about really sort of like a warning, like a, a reflection of ourselves. So they, in some ways they're a bit like evil eyes, but not really. Um, putting a curse on everyone, but more like just reflecting what we've done. So I'm kind of interested in that space. And I was thinking of the other work, which was immersion. And when um, Ted was talking about um, Monk's scream, I was thinking about how it's interesting not, you know, not, not always having a voice, but thinking about how in some ways that character is really silenced. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this reality about um, nature reclaiming space as well that I'm really interested in. I like the idea of, um, you know, there's retribution for what we've done in a way. Um, probably a little bit moralistic and judgmental on some levels, but mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of, I kind of get off on that. Maybe that's my dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant conclusion there, Anna. Thank you. And Darcy. Hello. Hi. Um, with my work, my main background is actually fashion and textiles. So compared to kind of what's been said, I don't necessarily call myself an artist, probably more towards a designer. I think I like to keep it within my frame of mind. But with the way in which I approach the dark side and especially with the studio, like my studio is my apartment floor cutting fabrics like silk, velvet and brocades just on my dirty apartment floor trying to construct things and see how things work. And that's always a very cathartic exploration because I really enjoy this idea and almost luxuriating deathliness and the macabre, kind of paralleling it with 40s glamour, um, looking at anatomical lithographs and the collages, which in the exhibition, which I use more as a way of approaching them like fashion illustrations rather than doing a full sketch telling myself I have to make this, which can be very limiting and can take its toll on you when you're trying to recreate this exact image, which is never going to happen because it's just stupid. I don't know why so many people do it. Um, 
but it kind of opens up this space to kind of explore the way in which I can approach fashion and textiles as my medium to kind of navigate the dark side. Um, and I just I kind of almost similarly kind of get off on it. It's just very titillating and tantalizing and kind of looking at deathliness as something quite erotic. Almost kind of like looking at it in the same way as the xenomorph from Alien, mm. that giant lacquered structure, mm -hmm. very seductive, very cunning, very primal, which I quite enjoy, that kind of perversion. You know, and that see real connection there with what Carla was saying, but and that, that kind of fusion again, that m morphing between public and private gaze, you know, what goes on, you know, in our interior spaces and then how that is then made explicit. Thanks very much, Darcy. Anything you want to say there? Sorry? No? And putting Ted's back on again, because obviously Ted's, uh, the, his role in this is obviously immeasurable, but as, as curator, you know, obviously you have this idea, you work towards it, and then here it is come to fruition. You know, and I know it's maybe not a lot of time to reflect on it, but has, you know, what's been surprising with the dark side, with the artist's works, maybe how works are resonating against each other. You know, Anna just mentioned there that, that connection that she's had. Mm. You know, I'm just wondering what, what sort of thoughts uh, do you have that's something that's happened that's been you know, surprising or unexpected? Thanks, Nicola. Well, I, the most surprising thing was the very first interview that I did about the exhibition, the very first question somebody said was, how did you ask people to be in this show? I mean, you were actually calling them crazy. And I went, no. And I realised I realized at that point that, in fact, there was this negativity, that as soon as you start dealing with the dark side, there is this assumption that this is bad or uh, unhealthy or unnecessary or we should avoid it. And I think one of the great things about the exhibition and all of the wonderful artists, and I'm so blessed to have all these fantastic artists who uh, participated in this project, um, is that it is not a negative thing. It, it is a way of dealing with the world and it is a very positive and structured way of dealing with the world and it is productive and it also has huge benefits for the community. I mean, I know I've just said all that, but it is, it, it really, ever since that very first interview, it made me feel this is really what I've got to keep pushing here. We'd, we shouldn't be seeing this as being a negative aspect of people's lives. That the dark side, um, and that, Paul, you, I mean, I used your example in a way of, of, this is a way of becoming, this is something which is coming out of the darkness. So it's not something which is something we should be afraid of, it's something that we should embrace, in fact, and we should make as much of it as possible. So I think that's the thing that I have learnt from the process of being in the curating. In terms of putting works together, it's always the, the great trick of being, you know, as a curator, you put things, you've got to find the place where they work and it seems quite sensible, you know, quite obvious, but it's never obvious. <laughs> you know, you go, oh, this one has to go there and then after you put everything up and make sure it all sits, you go, no, nah, no, nah, that doesn't work at all. So you've got to change the whole thing around. Like um, your video, you know, we had that in one place and then everything else was put around and all the relationships were built and then... Darcy's work had to be on a flat wall. It couldn't be on a on a texture wall. So no, that couldn't be there. And then all of the, so everything I did about seven plans of where all of the works were going to go together, and ultimately I think they they speak beautifully to each other. And maybe that is partly just fortuitous, but it's partly that process of just looking and thinking and working out what the works are, and what they're saying, and what partners they need to be able to say that even more eloquently. Um, so that that's basically the the good things that came for me out of it, apart from working with 14 absolutely amazing artists and, and the great generosity of um, Melissa and Stormy, uh, who provided the space, and Danielle, who is here somewhere, who's just been extraordinary throughout the whole process. So working with people, with colleagues, that's just a great benefit. Thanks very much, Ted. So just picking up on a couple of points that you raised in your talk, and for me, really largely, was the panacea idea. You know, art is not a panacea. Um, but it does go a long way, especially in our current context with funding cuts, you know, in any, I've just speaking before with Pauline, who works for Dada, and the amount of cuts that's happening in that, that sector. You know, what happens in universities, what's happening with galleries closing down, etc. So, but here we are resilient, and I think resilient was another key point that you were making. So I would like to, you know, put it to the panel that 
Obviously, we know the significance of the arts, but how do we navigate this current space in which our voices are increasingly unheard and pushed to the side? Does anyone want to have a chat? Paul? Um, I'll start. Um, uh, well, I think uh, one of the interesting things about that idea, uh, first of all, um, one, one point uh, Ted made was this idea that uh, to put on an exhibition like this is seen as a negative. And um, I'm actually interested to think that this is probably changing now, uh, um, but it is probably the first thing that people would see, the negative rather than the positive of it. Um, uh, but I'm wondering as well that we're not yet out of COVID, so we're in a period of still being in COVID. And I have this feeling that when we get on the other side of it, um, there'll be some realizations. Uh, and one of them will be, I think, that society is, uh, that mental health has become to the fore much more in people's everyday uh, consciousness and that something needs to be done. Now, on the, on the other, side, other side of that, um, uh, over the years in Australia, there have been many, many art schools, small art schools closing um, all over the country and a lot of them have been in regional places. Uh, so if you were to look at, uh, at that, do a little survey, you see all these tiny little places have closed and therefore it didn't create as much angst, I think, um, but I always, every time one of those closed, I thought, well, what about the mental health of that community? Because um, an unseen job, I think, of the art schools in general has been always uh, kind of like, I think art does that. It's almost like it can kind of adjust the pressure valves of the society. And um, now with all those things closing and uh, if uh, uh, other organisations are also feeling this, um, well, it, that something needs to be done. Uh, I think that that will become evident and then things might turn around. Sounds, I hope so, I really do. And um, Anna, did you want to add to um, that? Yeah, I mean, I've worked in the online space actually um, for a university for a very long time, um, 15 years. And it was really interesting during COVID seeing how <laughs> people had to take to online learning. And it was a really, um, I mean, I've always had the question, how do you teach art online? <laughs> People have really struggled with that over the years. So when, when everyone sort of had to come to this online space as an observer, it was a really interesting space. It was, it was interesting to see people's challenges, interesting to see that some people actually really liked this. And now we're seeing that in universities, so that drop off where, and, and, and other spaces as well, where, you know, we, we, we may never go back to the lecture you know, space, we may, we may be more online or, or, or operating in that space. So a lot of things have happened and it really has changed and it has meant, you know, job losses and things like that. Um, but there are, there are also, you know, there's negatives and positives within that space. There's, mm. there's some good things that have come out of it. Yeah, no, fantastic. Anyone else? Yes, Carla. I, I guess I do wonder, um, and I was teaching uh, over COVID as well and had to kind of, uh, I guess, um, navigate those those changes to online learning and I think some, the majority of students were really um, happy to kind of uh, just go with the flow which is great but I do wonder about the role of um, the kind of studio and the community building that you get at art school through sharing studio space talking to your peers you know um, and then maybe what support can be for people when they leave art school you know you see so many um people just drop off the radar and they never have a show again they never make art you know and i do wonder um what role that that community building p plays in a vibrant scene fantastic i'm just thinking there just you know considering what we've just been discussing and one of the things that really struck me with this, obviously dealing with that, going back to that kind of interiority and those kind of spaces of becoming that you're talking about, Paul, that, you know, reflecting on the exhibition, you know, what, what are some of your thoughts on how your work now is situated next to others? It's always a thing with group shows, isn't it? Suddenly your work, of course, is, is contextualised in a completely different way. And of course, it reverberates with the work that it's sitting alongside. It no longer is just that, that kind of private personal work. Um, any any thoughts on how your work is positioned in the show, or a work that you know that you're finding commonality with, or equally contestation with? Well, for me, the thing I kind of noticed because I was pro I was pro I think the last person brought into the group exhibition to kind of 
help at the kind of thing. <laughs> Can't quite remember, but I was kind of just asked on the fly, and then I was like, okay, cool, exhibition, put my stuff up. And I, it's that kind of thing where, for me at least, where when you're putting a lot of time and energy in the work, it's almost like the idea of setting up for the exhibition and everything, you kind of just go, oh, I can't wait for this to be over and done with so I can kind of relax a little bit because you're kind of running on high stress, which also feeds into things which is probably not great for mental health. But yeah. it's that kind of thing where, especially for me, because I, I was using collages because that's always the beginning point for a lot of my work. Whenever I'm doing a new body of work or a collection, that always starts there. So I don't think very much of them. They're done very on the fly. I just kind of download like two to three hundred photos and I just get them ch like printed really cheaply out of office works and I go, hey ho, let's just glue them together with a glue stick and some masking tape and see what happens. Um, so in the exhibition it's very weird for me to kind of see it in this almost very formal setting that I also have to respond to in the moment, because I didn't have an arrangement plan. I didn't even necessarily know where I was going until I got that final floor plan. Rock up, and I'm like, okay, cool. I think this is what I'm going to do. And then it was the same in the other one, too, where as soon as I set one up, it was about responding to it. And it was kind of this really uncomfortable feeling of being like, oh, God, like, do I even think of myself this seriously to have this stuff in here? But as well, it's kind of interesting to view it especially alongside other works where it's ex similar things are being explored but there's just such a range of how it's approached. I mean, I'm from fa fashion and textiles. Like, it's what I do is very different, different to what everyone else is doing but there's this kind of running theme that kind of creates a sense of synergy with it where everything's responding quite well but also at the moment you're just not really thinking it because you're just like running on caffeine and <laughs> stress and time constraints. No, no, for sure. Any, any other ones? The, any tenets? Yes? Because you raise a very interesting point, um, Darcy, and I think actually everybody's mentioned this, this idea of being in this sort of holistic state is when you're in the studio, when all of a sudden things start to make sense. You're not actually sure necessarily what you're doing. Uh, you, you think it, it might all go crazy or whatever, but all of a sudden you just feel, no, this is working. This is, I, I can see the connection between this and that in a way that you would never ever normally perhaps see that connection and all of a sudden it opens up the world to you. I always think that's one of the most valuable things about being an artist and having that opportunity in, the, in your brain to start flowing freely into ideas and gathering things together. But how do we sell that? That's what I would really like to know. How do we sell that to the community? Because it sounds so airy-fairy and so, you know, it doesn't seem to have any logical constructive research behind it which would convince people that this is what you should be doing. Yet we all know that it is absolutely the reason you should be doing it and you can cope with the world if you have this sense of flow and, and able to see connections. So can, does anybody have any ideas about how we might better sell it? <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, the, the image you showed uh, earlier, Ted, where there's a um, almost like a scientific examination of what's going on with the creative process. Um, I think that um, that would be, uh, this, this period we're in now might actually be a period to trigger more investigations of this ma manner to find out what actually goes on. Um, you know, what are the changes, the chemical changes that happen inside the mind and the body? And um, how is this, this uh, term of well-being? how does that actually express itself? And I think that um, then, and doing that, one needs to also immediately take it away from the advertising companies who seem to be in danger of taking it and turning it into soap or something. Um, uh, you know, uh, but th this is what needs to happen, I think, yeah. And this really resonates there, Paul, too, with that kind of mythologised artist, you know, that, that sort of side too. And I think that, you know, the way that the maybe we're generalised as artists and, and we're put into lots of little pockets and I think, you know, what's demonstrable across this exhibition is how that space moving from that very intimate, um, you know, emotional space that we inhabit and how that is then tethered within a public context that is, of course, curated. But certainly the dialogue and really critical dialogue is apparent. Mm. 
And uh, you know, and I think it's that broader engagement that we all do, that we have this intimate space that we're all talking about, but then we are very aware that it will be made public. You know, and by being made public, that you know, where there's lots at stake in, in that sense. And you know, we were just having a little bit of a laugh before about, you know, as artists, often it is our work, of course, that we put up. You know, and as educators, it's w this is what we're used to doing. But as artists, it's a very different thing. But here we are, of course, trying to navigate that kind again that nexus, mm -hmm. and it's that constant sort of movement between. So I think that it's about that engagement with the social world. It's about the way that you know that works can comment and offer, for me anyway, an alternative to the the increasingly narrow view of everyday life worlds and what that is and what that might mean. So I, you know, I think that we have got so much to sell, <laughs> but the problem is how do we do it within a context that is so utterly micromanaged, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I think this becomes our agenda as artists, you know, that rather than how do we navigate it again? Is that navigate words for me today? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we navigate it as artists? Any thoughts on, you know, how we might do that? Just one. I've just uh, thought that one thing that uh, unites everybody uh, uh, on the panel is time and how, how time is used. And so um, uh, a lot of uh, labour involved in the making of the works. And um, if, in a way, again, with this idea of everything seems to be wanting to be measured now, um, well, why not measure that? Because, of course, uh, this is incredible. I always think this is a, it's a, so, a social gift the artists will give. Uh, I'm so aware of that when I go into see exhibitions, the amount of time that goes into making something. Now, what if we were to measure that? I mean, uh, there's an enormous amount of time I know made uh, with the works. So I can sense that time um, as I go around the exhibition. I don't know what uh, the other panellists think. It's always that kind of funny question where people always ask me, like, why? do you do what you do? But I'm always just like, why not? And they're always like trying to overthink. It's like, oh, but how are you getting anything out of it? Like, why are you doing it? Like, are you even gonna get any money from it? Like, <laughs> of course, as we're talking about trying to sell something. Um, but it's always, for me, it always comes back to that question of like, why not? Even with things like what I look at, what I explore thematically and conceptually, it's always just, why not? And I think, Especially when things kind of start to become overly articulate, you kind of almost want to strip it back and almost simplify it to that really nice premise of just going, why not? And that seems a bit more exciting because it becomes a bit more open-ended and it gives you freedom of choice and freedom of expression to kind of do whatever it is that you kind of want to do. Because, of course, that's a great privilege. Like, what we do is a great privilege. Sitting here is a great privilege talking about our work, which is probably one of the things that a lot of us probably don't enjoy doing a lot as well, because the point of putting up work is for people to look at it and read it and take what they want from it. But at the same time, it's probably best just keep saying, why not, in a very confident, joyous way, because it just gives us the opportunity to kind of have freedom of choice and kind of bypass all that idea of meeting standards and meeting criteria. KPIs and all that jazz. I think um, potentially a distinction um, needs to be drawn for the public, maybe, between um, a professional practitioner um, whose, whose artwork is their job and that's, you know, a, a full-time career or even a part-time career and, and somebody who's using um, creative um, methods as, you know, a, as a hobby or a way to relax because sometimes being in the studio is just torture um, and all the things that go along with making art is, is the worst. Um, like an exhibition opening, like I don't, I don't want to go to that. So agree. Um, it's like the sprint at the end of the marathon. Um, and then you have to talk to people, oh my God, you have to put a dress on. Um, and, and a lot of people I know feel the same way and, and you know, and then uh, money and it, all those things, you know, that go along with um, struggle, being a struggling artist, I guess. But um, I don't know, but again, I guess the question of the 
day is how do, how do we make the non-art making public, you know, t take us seriously? M maybe they don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's the million and one dollar question. Um, and I think too, it's always, again, really been reminded here what Darcy's saying about privilege. Mm. And you know, I'm certainly privilege. I'm very privileged, totally privileged. And it's privilege, but then it's also that social engagement. It's the fact that, you know, that what we're dealing with, it's not just about oh, how I feel necessarily, but it's how I feel based upon broader contextual spaces. And, you know, and I think that that's really important that we do that. And certainly, um, you know, that it's not just about me, but it's about maybe my view of the world, but in engagement and in conversation with and ethically engaging with, it has to be all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think when we've got all of those things, that, that shift it, 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 you know, because we're not just, we're being mindful of our broader communities, we're being mindful of how the work might be communicated, translated, Im mm -hmm. felt, immersed in, experienced. And I think by doing that, we move into a different, a different space. But again, how do we communicate that? I, yes. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> again, the million and one dollar question. Um, you know, anyone, anything else you want to say about that or anything you want to ask each other? Um, Paul. Thanks. And I'd like to ask you about your process. Um, so I, it's clear to me that someone could take photographs of these creatures, um, but you have not. Uh, there's something else at work. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, I haven't taken photographs, but I have sort of, you know, trolled through the internet <laughs> and found um, different animals that I've sort of dissected and uh, played with how I want to explore that. Um, but I'm actually, the medium that I've worked in for anyone that hasn't seen the exhibition is, is watercolour. I'm really new to watercolour, <laughs> like two, two years or something. So it's a, it's a very new medium. In fact, I'm what I would classify as a drawer. So I'm a drawer who's painting at the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure that I know everything yet and I still feel like I'm very much a novice learning as I go. Um, but what I have discovered is that my process does seem to be quite different from other people doing or working in that medium. Um, I, when Ted was talking, talking earlier about control, I, uh, although I, I don't know if I feel like I have control over the work and watercolour is a medium you don't always have control over, I somehow try to control it, I think. <laughs> I, um, I do, I really love detail and I kind of get maybe slightly obsessive compulsive about detail and do try to squeeze in as much as I possibly can. Um, but I do, I work, the process itself, I actually work, um, you know, I, I, I stretch my paper, I, um, I go through lots of different processes with spraying and, um, you know, dripping and then going back in and sort of, you know, excruciatingly adding layer upon layer upon layer of detail. So, you know, things that might take other people, you know, perhaps an hour to do, I might be still working on three months later. <laughs> I don't know why I've done this to myself, but anyway, I have. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's re really interesting, though, actually, to come from that space. And, and actually, for anyone that doesn't know me, I say I'm a drawer, but actually, I've largely worked with sculpture for the last 20 years. So, um, yeah, so I'll pass it on to you. Sculpture? Sculpture. Yeah, I did a lot of... Um, you know, uh, electronic roadkill rabbits at one point and some, you know, big machines, uh, roulette wheel, different things over the years. Does anyone, uh, oh, maybe I should return the question to Paul and ask about your process. Um, I, I'm going to ask uh, Carla actually, <laughs> because I'm sort of still interested in the time aspect and it seems to me there's a, a lot of problem solving going on in your work, but also the, the, the it's very unusual process that you're following. I wouldn't mind. I'm always obsessed with process. I wouldn't mind knowing more about that. Mm. I guess there's a um, the question of where my process starts and ends because um, there's a lot of trawling uh, dating apps, <laughs> having com uh, getting sent unwanted pictures. You know, and it's like whoa. Well, where, where where does the personal start and end and when does the work and 
that that's a whole different question, I suppose. Um, but yeah, there's always um, uh, lots of screenshots, drawing, um, painting, lots of hoarding of materials in the studio, jamming shit together to see what it looks like. And then, yeah, it usually ends in something textile base, which I can't really escape for some reason. Yes. Yeah. There's some action happening over here. <laughs> a lot of action going on. Sorry, Carla. I, I, I'm done. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks very much. Um, can I please now invite all of you, you know, rather than just listening in, to become active within this conversation? It would be terrific. And certainly I extend that online as well. Some questions are just coming through or some some points for consideration, but is, I'll open up to our physical audience first. First, is there anyone, Clive? Question. Oh, great. Uh, thanks to the panel and uh, everybody. It's a great discussion. Um, I was thinking today that it's a bit of a mix of kind of art and science will be happening this afternoon when Joan talks. And there's a quote that always sticks in my head and it's talking about art, practice and research. And it says that, um, Science is about we, and art is about I, right? That's not mine, by the way, before you start emailing me at the weekend. Um, and it, it talks of self-indulgence, that artists talk, you know, speak about themselves, but there's no connection. I don't believe that, by the way. So I just wondered if anybody on the panel can talk about their work in terms of how they think they're representing others who don't have a creative voice and don't have an outlet for feelings, or is it just about how you feel, or is it... Is there some representation going on there about society in general? I, I, I just say in the past, that's definitely been an issue for me. I think, as I said before, I've, I've used my art to sort of voice my feelings and um, a lot of earlier work was about coming out as gay and doing things like that. So it's definitely been something that I have explored and I have done it for not only to help myself, but to help others. Um, in, in, in a way, I think this work is also engaging in a broader conversation about, you know, the absolute <laughs> fear we have moving forward about well, what's happening to the planet and stuff like that. So I am sort of trying to engage and allow other people to come into that space as well, and hopefully they can contribute to the conversation. I think especially in particular for me, I'm, it, what I do is still quite indulgent because I enjoy it a lot which is why I'm doing it but I always just kind of view what I do as just helping kind of facilitate the conversation as to what fashion and textiles can represent I think if I start to concern myself with how it's going to be responded to how people are going to view it I would probably never leave bed I would just wallow in my own thoughts of <sighs> What's everyone going to think? It's that whole thing. It's like, if I cared what anyone else thought about me, I would never do anything with my life. So for me, it's just always keeping it quite broad um, because, of course, what I do is, like, again, it's a privilege. So if I can at least use it to help facilitate and develop a conversation, that way I can kind of engage with others that think in a similar way and collaborate and work with others that also think in a similar way without trying to be like, I have to cater to everything in the kitchen sink, which is just impossible, and you'll stretch yourself thin. So it's kind of how I view that. Anyone else? Would close um, point? That passed the parcel. Thank you. Um, I really love that question about the idea that uh, there's this division between science and art, and the idea that, well, this generalisation about the we and the I, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think that art um, is all about the social and, and, and connecting others. And I also think that those, those sorts of um, generalisations are, are perhaps where we could start the conversation to break that down because, uh, in fact, of course, art was always engaging with science and, and is always engaging with methodologies which is uh, very connected to uh, big questions such as why are we on the planet and what are we doing here and how we, do we plan to move forward? Um, uh, big questions have always been asked by art and science. So I think we're in the same place. We just need to be in the same tent and understand that we have the similar concerns and we should try to break down this uh, division, divisional language. Um, and I do think that um, from that point of view, 
the artists are, uh, well, uh, artists, art can do that, and so can science. We should work together more. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Clive. Is that answer your, yeah? Anyone else on the floor? Pauline. Um, I, I noticed uh, uh, somebody spoke about um, funding and digital. You know, uh, when we have the lockdowns and things, many of uh, some of the people up there said that they go online and teach. Well, in the organisation that I work for, which is Dada, uh, we had, of course, a lockdown because they're people with disabilities and mental illness and things. So when we went in, when the first lockdown happened, uh, I had to go off work because I'm over 75 or whatever it was. So I went off work for three months. But then we had to, as an organisation, think about how we were going to engage with the people that couldn't come there. And they rely on our service. Uh, it keeps them well, it keeps them healthy, it keeps it, and it's about social inclusion. So we were faced with this new digital media, but what I noticed was that the people that we work with uh, don't have the means to, many of them from group homes, don't have the means to connect digitally so therefore they were left out from art lessons and so forth because they haven't got access to the internet they don't have the sometimes they don't even have the phones and things like that and these are just ordinary citizens who just happen to have a disability and or disadvantage now people were talking about funding now we've gone over to the the NDIS, which is the National Disability Insurance Scheme providers. That is a nightmare for us to manage, to say the least. Uh, we've had to employ far more uh, administration staff and we have sort of like have to really think about all these bureaucratic um, things that come from the NDIA, which is the board, and they set all these standards and stuff, and we've got so much reporting. Each arts, well, I'm an arts worker, and I teach there, and I have to write out a report, quite a lengthy one, every week on the person that I support. And a lot of that's done in our own time, but the funding and the lack of technology availability for people with disability and that are disadvantaged. I'm wondering if anybody on the panel can suggest ways of, you know, what we can do about getting governments to recognise this. And we, we, you were talking about recognising the arts as essential to social well-being and mental health. So I'd like to ask the panel to respond to that. Hello there. <laughs> I'm an occupational therapist who oh, yeah. have worked a lot in the NDIS. Yeah. Sadly, it's finished, but there was an awareness that for people to engage in the programs that they were already engaging in, that there was funding for tablets and things like that so that people could access their things. So you could actually apply if they're an NDIS participant and their program fits their goals, which it would, um, they would provide technology to access that. Yeah. For the internet, just so then that's to go with the next planning meeting sort of thing. But at least it's a start. If you can go to a cafe and use it, no. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I know. Of course, I hate the NDIS as much as you, which is why I'm doing art now instead. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's tiny ways. But I think it's just about being noisy as well and saying this is not quite enough. And you know, go to the planning meetings that they always ignore you at anyway. And. Um, Keep trying. It certainly does, though, exacerbate when you think about that, that privilege that we're, mm, we're commenting yeah. on, then people not even having access to digital technologies. And that happened at universities as well, in those seemingly very privileged spaces. Yes, at the back there. Thanks. Hi there. Hi, Hi there. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to talk to that, um, how do we get that out there? And so what I loved about this was leaning into the darkness. And what I, I experienced through COVID was the darkness, the isolation, the um, aloneness. But in that 
came an incredible amount of creativity. I had to get fucking creative. I had to learn how to cook. I'd never cooked and that was a wonderful creative experience. I had to learn how to use the internet and learn how to use it for Zoom meetings and, and then I was painting everything. I was painting absolutely anything I could get my hands on and all I want to say to that is that, you know, be prepared I think is, is important because there will be a, a generation of people coming out that have lived through this that understand that wealth and prestige and is not actually that important. It's about a spiritual connection to oneself and how can I express that. And so I, I think leaning into that darkness is really important rather than just um, saying that it's a part of. It's actually, it's, it's, it's actually really quite significant in people's lives today. And it's interesting that we're talking about darkness and being a brown woman. Um, you know, I, I just feel it's just really interesting how we talk about the darkness being so um, taboo and difficult and da 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 when, when really I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm not. There's a light and there's a, you know, so there's language. It's around language. So thanks, that's all I needed to say. Oh, I do have a women's choir. That's the, that's the thing. As I watched these women um, come into themselves through singing and music and it's overrun. I've got a waiting list a hundred long because people are wanting to express how they feel in, in some way or another. Thank you. Under sense of belonging, under sense of community, under sense of social interaction and inclusion, you know, all of those things. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yes, someone over here. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm going to first start with a quote, the strongest people are those whose battles we know nothing about. And I guess as artists, we have a release to our art. But I'm really curious, you were talking about trans transcendence, anxiety, um, and obviously to show the dark side, you have to be brutally honest with yourself. And you also have your worst self-critic. And I, I just... I guess you also have to go into this space, which is not a very comfortable place sometimes to do with what you're dealing with. So I'm just curious how people on the panel manoeuvre through this process and pull yourself, uh, first of all, allow yourself to go into that space, but how you pull yourself out the other side of it as well um, in your process. I have the potentially rather unhealthy habit of channeling everything into the work whatever it might be, heartbreak or stress or, you know, whatever. It just all gets put into the work, which um, I probably should speak to a therapist about, really. But, um, I mean, that's how I do it. But It's all because, of course, I, for my work, I'm always my worst critic and it always kind of, rump, kind of tumbles down to that feeling where it's like, I love to hate myself and I hate to love myself. And it kind of oscillates between the two. But then it's always a matter of looking at the work and taking what I do seriously, but not taking myself seriously. So I can kind of have a bit of separation from the work where I treat it more as an extension of what it is that I enjoy, what I'm going through, what I kind of want to explore, which doesn't always work, of course. Sometimes I go down the creative K-hole of weirdness and I'm like why but as well like those moments as well you kind of have to relish it and see what comes out of it and you really just have to sit with the discomfort to see what can be generated and you have to accept that for sure thanks Darcy anyone else on the floor yeah Claire Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or I would just really like to get um, the panel's ideas. Um, last week in um, Art Guide magazine there was an a, um, article about people with disabilities who were um, the challenge of being an openly disabled person um, as opposed to um, non-disabled. <laughs> um, and I, it, it kind of just strikes me that um, we're talking about a lot of artists that work outside of that <laughs> um, and
and I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on, um, so, sorry, <laughs> um, like the professional versus the, the hobby artist and, and then where that comes into with, with um, organisations like Dada, which work with people with disabilities. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's what I'm wondering if that, that gets lost because, um, because they're, they're not considered um, professional artists. Yes. Maybe we should talk about serious artists rather than professional artists. But mm. I know that there is a clearly a distinction between somebody who earns their profession from their practice. But there are a lot of people who are very serious who don't do that. Mm. And I think they're the people we're talking about. I mean, you know, um, Clive Collender, wow, what a fantastic serious artist he is. I don't know, I don't know if we call him a professional artist, but he is certainly a very serious artist. We've got an online. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I'd just like to say, uh, in answer to that, um, one of the things I think that art does and needs to be uh, understood more is this idea of the value, the word value uh, of art, and I think that is something that is is expressed across um, whomever is doing that, uh, because I think that that potential to uh, experience pure potential, you know, that there's something happening here whatever it is, that can happen uh, for everybody. And I think that that is um, also beyond language. It goes beyond language, and so ironically we use language today to talk about this, and that's one of the ironies of art. Um, but I think value is something that um, is, is very much there at the heart of this, and, um, and, and how we work with that is the way forward. So five minutes to go. We've got two on the floor and one online here. So maybe we'll have to leave it at that. But yes, you were first, I think. Yep. We'll go back to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I'm just interested to know how each of the artists felt when they were invited to participate in this show. Um, just in terms of, yeah, what we we're talking about, maybe the stigma attached to mental health and how, yeah, how that kind of played out for them. Well, I didn't really think that much of it because like what I, it, what I look at, what I explore just seems so innate to what I do. I was like, oh, cool, it's almost like an exhibition that's within my field and interest. Yay! Um, but I just didn't really think that Seriously, because I it's the same with just kind of anything, just taking a level of seriousness out of it so you don't overthink the meaning and understanding and all that overwrought stuff so you can kind of just be like, all right, I'm putting some work in, I'm seeing where it goes, seeing who responds and connects and what kind of narratives and ideas that come from it. I felt really uncomfortable, actually, because um, I thought about... A lot of artists that I know that deal with severe um, mental health problems and issues and I feel what right have I got to be in the show so I felt deeply uncomfortable and still feel uncomfortable but then reflecting on it within more recent context my role as a teacher my role as an artist my role through you know the impact through COVID and through the years of working with different amazing people that have um, mental health um, issues. I don't want to use the word issue. So I felt uncomfortable actually. But what I've realised is that having forums like this, which are inclusive, are really important because you know my voice still matters. But I'm humbled by people that go through every day with severe difficulty. So it's, it's about that navigation and opening up, opening up a forum and an experience of looking at artwork and engaging with artwork that uh, is actually made from a myriad of experiences. And it's the, the significance of an everyday, the everydayness and the life world context of every one of us that put into a melting pot in a way. And actually, how do we navigate that space? That's what's interesting for me. I think I, I initially, when I received the email from Ted, sort of 
was a little bit, oh wow, I've been exposed. <laughs> yeah, but in, when I actually read the email, then I was like, no, actually this really connects with me. And um, I was, you know, really started to think about, you know, my last 20 plus years of practice and, you know, all of those things that we just do. And I think someone was talking earlier about, you know, I, I think it might have been Carl, when you, I, she sort of puts everything into work. I, I sort of think I've gone from exhibition to exhibition and tried to keep myself busy and not really thought about anything. And, and, and then and a while ago I had a, a, f a few injuries where I had to sort of like be, you know, in bed rest for a few months. Mm -hmm. And it actually made me really reflect on all the stuff that I'd done over time. And, and some of the connections that you can make 20 years later that you can't make, you know, a month or two months or three months, you know, I find that a really interesting space. So I, I, from that perspective, I sort of was able to really sort of think about, you know, all of the stuff that I'd done over time and, and how, you know, there were, <laughs> some really obvious links that, you know, made sense. I guess personally, as someone that lives with a chronic illness and depression, it was, um, uh, I felt excited to be included in the, um, in the wonderful lineup and was felt fortunate to be able to um, participate and uh, I guess contribute in that way. Um, and, I felt glad that I felt seen in a way by you, Ted, and happy that someone understood and got it, you know, because I think, as we've all said, art making can be quite an insular and um, private experience. But for someone, and um, we haven't really worked together before, but for someone to then kind of see the work and get it and understand it, it you know, that's great. Um, I, I saw it as an opportunity to, uh, I think one of the things about mental health and the way it's often seen in, say, uh, the media is it's always, it's almost like it only turns up as a term when things have got really bad, you know, when it's come past crisis point. And um, uh, my feeling about it is that um, a great thing about this exhibition and this uh, opportunity is this idea that, um, well, actually, uh, this is a way to talk about... Uh, yeah, just sort of to, being able to fine tune those valves and recognise that things can be worked on well before things get really, really bad. So from that point of view, it's not like not not dissimilar to the idea that everyone should take a walk every day for 30 minutes. You know, so what are we doing about our general mental health? So that's where I was coming from. Thanks. way to finish but I was just wanting to riff off um, what Paul had said and um, the part of the conversation that was about a response to how art's been marginalised um, uh, and, and that was that maybe art um, needs to actually privilege more and more the idea that it fits into an economy of emotions and spiritual connections and it's not just about um, kind of uh, a response or an antidote to kind of any madnesses of mental health, but it's actually um, 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 potentially um, the, 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 the in-between space that exists um, in the divided languages that's very prominent and um, that it's actually in that in-between space that we get to connect to ourselves and to others and that's what everybody wants whether you're a FIFO worker, a tradie, um, you know, um, an advocate of um, liberal Morrison's kind of um, values that we all want to connect to ourselves and to others in community and uh, so anyway I've, I've made a statement um, <laughs> but actually um, it was just about putting that forward and just seeing how else you might riff off that and I was just riffing off what Paul had said. What a beautiful and eloquent way to actually conclude the session. Thank you very much. Uh, there is um, a point here and interestingly it kind of touches on what you're saying and I think what we've just been doing in the last, the last hour and this person's asking as a result of the show have conversations arisen you know, amongst the artists that are actually, you know, that have added to your understandings, your knowledges of the dark side? And does anyone want to answer that? I'm happy just to, to say that this experience, you know, actually having a forum, as uncomfortable as it might have been at the beginning, but actually sharing these stories and actually immersing ourselves within the works has actually really added much value. Paul mentioned value before, 
And I think, you know, it's, it's quite resonant within this discussion. And um, there was one more here, a book by Living, it's called Living with a Creative Mind, written by Jeff and Julie Crabtree, psychologist and researcher in the field of creativity and mental health. And basically this person's just asking, are we aware, anyone aware of that particular book? And if not, it's a really valuable resource. So we might make that sort of visible for everyone. So I want to thank the panel, wonderful, amazing, exciting, dynamic, and, um, and to a brilliant audience, thanks so much for your questions. And it's, it's lunchtime. And thank you, Nicola. Oh, thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, for our second keynote speaker, um, Associate Professor Joanne Dixon from the School of Arts and Humanity. Joanne? Thank you. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wujak Noongar peoples, past, present and emerging. The dark side in mental health. In pre-COVID-19 times, the World Health Organization reported one quarter of the global population is at risk of developing a serious mental health condition in their lifetime. And one fifth of all children and adolescents are at risk of developing serious mental health problems. Similar statistics were also reported here in Australia with one in four Australians experiencing a serious mental health challenge in their lifetime. Anxiety and depression are among the most common and pervasive mental health difficulties. And the heavy social and emotional toll of COVID-19 has seen an escalation of mental health problems due to risk factors such as stress, insecurity, uncertainty, isolation and loneliness, to name but a few. My main research interest is in the field of mental health and improving people's quality of life. This research began some 20 years ago when undertaking my PhD at the University of London. At the time, there was a lack of research studying conditions such as depression and anxiety from a motivational perspective, despite motivation being fundamental to our human experience. Motivation typically gives people a sense of meaning and purpose in life. It energises and mobilises much of our human behaviour. And it also provides a framework for interpreting everyday life experience. Hence, over the years, much of my research has focused on studying the nature of mental health struggles such as anxiety and depression from a motivation perspective. Another main line of study has been the interplay between motivation, cognition or thinking processes and emotion in mental health. These psychological processes are integral to each other for instance, personal strivings, aspirations and inner drives are intimately linked to our emotions and how we think. To date, mental health research and clinical work tends to focus predominantly on identifying symptoms and developing more effective treatments to alleviate mental health difficulties. But far less attention has been paid to the potential benefits of engaging with the dark side of mental health struggles. Today's talk has led me to reflect more deeply on my work from the perspective of the dark side, both its potential benefits and risks, and to reflect on how the dark side applies to mental health in the context of art and creativity. So drawing on my research today, I will explore understandings of emotion, motivation and cognition in mental health. My research has been conducted in community, educational and clinical settings. But in today's talk, I will attempt to draw meaningful threads of potential relevance in the context of art and creativity. And I'd like to conclude with a few key findings drawn from the extant research literature and personal reflections to capture the influential role of the artist and the arts and creativity in promoting mental health and well-being. So I begin by looking at emotions, as emotions are integral to motivation and mental health. Positive and negative emotions are often presented as all-encompassing categories. However, within these broad categorisations, emotions are typically discrete. For example, elation and contentment each represent 
positive emotions, but are quite distinct feeling states. Positive and negative emotions are not in themselves good or bad. They are often transitory and can be beneficial. Emotional states can act as signals that draw us to pay attention to personal experience, potentially leading to deeper self-awareness and self-discovery. They represent valuable and colourful windows to lived experience, meaning making and connections to the world around us. Arts engage in the full spectrum and depth of human emotions, both positive and negative. They can convey a range of complex emotions simultaneously, such as excitement and fear, or hope and sadness, reflecting the complexity and depth of human experience. To quote W.H. Auden, poetry might be defined as the clear expression of mixed feelings. Emotions may also be layered in depth and meaning. The work by Moritz Müller, titled Rooftops in the Winter, 1944, depicts an idyllic, peaceful village setting with snow-capped rooftops. But underlying this serene image lie the horrors of the ghetto. Müller painted over 500 works during his time in the Theresienstadt ghetto in Czechoslovakia. His painting evokes multiple layers of emotion and meaning. Beneath the picturesque winter landscape is the haunting reality that exists. The arts have the power to unlock inner doors of emotion, interpretation and meaning, and to invite the observer to enter their emotional experience and journey of self-discovery. Research conducted with colleagues has also studied inner motives in relation to mental health. Inner motives typically drive our thoughts, behaviours and emotions. And our research has shown that inner motives which are coherent with deep intrinsic values, interests and the autonomous self promote and maintain well-being. In contrast, extrinsic motivation, those motives driven by rewards, accolades or doing something to avoid a sense of shame or guilt has been associated with increased psychological distress. It strikes me that in giving artistic expression, the artist naturally and courageously gravitates towards their inner authentic self. In a recent ABC documentary, I was struck by the artist Fred Olson's words, I did not choose art, it chose me. Reflecting a deep-seated sense of identity and inner calling as an artist. So how do our emotions, both positive and negative, fit within motivation? Prominent neurological theories posit we have two fundamental motivational systems an approach type system and an avoidance type system. So I'd ask you to bear with me kindly while I briefly describe these two motivational systems to show how they connect with our emotions in the context of specific mental health struggles. Conceptually, approach motivation guides our sensitivity to reward pleasurable and meaningful experiences. And it's thereby thought to give rise to positive emotions such as joy, elation, contentment, the closer we become to the desired or meaningful outcome. Alternatively, it can also give rise to negative emotions such as sadness, depression, frustration or anger if someone sees themselves as not making the sufficient progress or if the striving towards the desired outcome is thwarted in some way. In contrast, avoidance motivation guides our sensitivity to threat and gives rise to negative emotions such as fear and anxiety when threats are impending. 
or positive emotions such as calmness and relief upon escape from looming threats. In the case of avoidance, my past research has consistently characterised by anxiety by an increased focus on avoidance or bad things potentially happening to the self. For example, people experiencing anxiety tend to be hypervigilant in monitoring potential signals of threat to try and prevent the threat from occurring. Heightened focus on avoidance can be emotionally exhausting and cognitively taxing as it requires the person to identify all possible avenues in which the threat might occur in order to successfully block it. Although avoidance can be a useful strategy in the short term, it may not be particularly helpful in the long term. Rather than engaging in avoidance, the artist through artistic expression confronts their fears, anxieties and uncertainties. The ability to embrace perceived threats and give visual expression has the potential to lead to deep personal transformation if one can navigate or overcome fear. Such transformation arguably leads to deeper self-understanding and personal growth, as well as alleviating distressing emotions such as anxiety. The artist courageously models a way to confront and lean into deep-seated fears and anxieties, both personally and societally. One caveat to note though, approach and avoidance motivations cannot be simplistically described as good or bad. Depending on the mental struggle a person is experiencing, bolstering avoidance motivation or dampening approach motivation may be beneficial. For example, in research we've conducted in the area of addiction. In terms of approach motivation, seminal research consistently characterised it by increased subjective well-being. However, this early research was almost exclusively undertaken with undergraduate university students and tended to focus so solely on well-being. But the story is more nuanced. When we study mental health struggles, our research has shown that underdrive and overdrive on the approach system can be problematic for people and increase the risk of mood conditions such as depression and bipolar. For example, People struggling with bipolar or hypermania symptoms can go into overdrive on approach motivation and have difficulty down-regulating positive emotions. At this point, I'd like to present two very brief interviews, um, extracts <coughs> with Stephen Fry, an English actor, broadcaster, comedian, director and writer, to pick up on this sort of continuum on the approach motivation system. And from a slightly different perspective, again, a study conducted in the United States found that people living with bipolar struggles reported trying to avoid rewarding activity as a means to prevent mania and reported trying to dampen their positive emotions. The conclusions drawn from this research suggested that people suffering with bipolar struggles are well aware of the potential for pleasurable experiences such as celebratory occasions or achievements to trigger mania. Hence, they may take steps to avoid positive emotion and reward for fear of not being able to down-regulate their emotions and motivational drive. Anecdotally, however, this seems a different story for the artist as powerfully captured in the interview clip with Stephen Fry. And to quote the poet again, don't take my demons away because my angels might flee too. In a similar vein, as cited in the project outline, the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch professed, my, my fear of life is necessary to me as is my illness. They are indistinguishable from me and their destruction would destroy my art. 
Our humanity has been inestimably enriched by artists who courageously and wholeheartedly invest in giving artistic expression to their emotional experience and inner psyche. For example, Schumann, when he was in a manic state, would compose feverishly, whereas he was virtually paralysed when he fell into depression. As a Western society, we seem to be highly approach-focused and driven. Culturally, we are perhaps less at ease or adept at embracing threats, uncertainty, or diminished approach states, such as hopelessness, sadness, frustration. From this perspective, the artist counterculturally and bravely embraces the full range of, em of emotions. They model a way of becoming fully human and holistic in integrating both the light and dark sides of humanity. Work we've done to a body of research I've conducted with colleagues has also examined the role that cognition plays in relation to motivation and mental health. For example, we've studied, as examples, we've studied expectations, perceived control, motivational conflicts. Expectations res refer to the perceived likelihood of a desirable or an undesirable experience happening to the self. And the control refers to the perceived control a person believes they possess in being able to achieve or successfully avoid a certain outcome. Whereas the motivational conflict refers to the tension experienced in being drawn in opposing or multiple directions. In a recent study, we looked at the role of rumination in motivation and emotion, which I'll present as an example of cognition in relation to mental health. Rumination refers to the negative, repetitive thinking or overthinking in that self-critical way. Our past research has found that underdrive or what we call low approach motivation and difficulty progressing towards the desired state or experience gives rise to depression. So the greater the discrepancy someone feels from the desired outcome. In contrast, studies have consistently shown that avoidance motivation gives rise to anxiety. Striving, struggling to strive toward the desired self is thought to instigate rumination. Therefore, in this present project, we studied whether rumination played a role in explaining the relationship between people's motivational strivings and their emotion. We found ruminative thinking did significantly explain the relationship between difficulties in progressing toward the desired self and both anxiety and depression. Whereas lack of progress towards what we call the ought self, who I should be and versus who I currently am, was directly linked to avoidance. The ought self is thought to be driven by an underlying avoidance. For example, a student might say, I ought to pass my exam in order to avoid feeling a failure among my peers. The findings suggested that psychological distress is experienced to the extent it's accompanied by repetitive negative self-focus on the discrepancy we experience between the desired self, who I want to be, and the actual self, who I actually am. In the case of the ought self, the necessity to take immediate action in response to an imminent threat may hold one's complete attention and detract from the mental resources need to actually engage in rumination. As an overview, our past research for the most part supports the view that motivation, cognition and emotional regulation are intimately interconnected and play a role in mental health struggles such as depression and anxiety. The 
final part of the talk, I'd like to look at engaging in art and creativity. So drawing on the extant literature and research, I offer, offer a few key highlights and personal reflections on the beneficial impact of the arts and creativity and the role of the artist in relation to mental health. A growing body of research has demonstrated improved cognitive and mood effects by engaging in art and creativity. For instance, drawing and painting have been shown to stimulate memories for people living with dementia and assist people to reconnect with the world around them. Expressing oneself through art has been shown to reduce stress levels and increase resilience for people living with depression, anxiety and physical conditions such as cancer. Creating art and engaging in a pleasurable activity has been shown to stimulate the release of a chemical called dopamine. This feel-good neurotransmitter aids in battling depression. Extensive research highlights the beneficial effects of art therapy. Professional art therapy began in the mid-20th century as a restorative practice to serve the needs of veterans returning from the two world wars, veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress. Trauma affects the brain's speech centres. As such, the effectiveness of traditional talk-based therapies is limited. Engaging in art such as drawing and painting allows for non-verbal expression of deep-seated emotions when words are inadequate or too unspeakable to verbalise. The ability to express the not yet cognizant or semi-conscious experience. Art therapy provides a safe space for a person to explore new ways of seeing, thinking and experiencing and a way to regain a sense of personal control. The cathartic effect of expressing painful emotions in art form presents pathways to understanding personal mental health. Not in a fragmented way, nor through the unitary lens of diagnosis, but as an integrated holistic person. The very process of artistic expression invites a journey of self-reflection and self-discovery enabling a person to make sense of their experience and their world. From an emotional regulation perspective, art allows one to externalise experiences and complex painful and disturbing emotions in a protected space. Art also has the power to evoke positive emotions such as awe and wonder. Experimental research has shown that when we gaze upon beautiful art it stimulates strong activity in the region of the brain related to pleasure and is accompanied by increased blood flow in the same region. Engaging in, in experiences that elicit these emotions, such as when we are absorbed in beautiful music, nature or art, is thought to have a positive impact on our mental health. And to I'd like to conclude on the role of the artist. While the artist com courageously confronts their inner psyche, they also give artistic expression to their external world. The role of the artist has a broad societal reach, critique and impact. Adversities such as war, torture, conflict, natural disasters, poverty, pandemics, seem to resound a collective call to arms to the artist. Artists powerfully capture memories, present realities and imagined and hoped for futures. We need only look to history for evidence of this. Take for example Franco's Spanish Civil War and artists such as Pablo Picasso. On the 26th of April, 1937, Guernica, a small town in northern Spain, was obliterated by Nazi warplanes at the behest of Spain's General mm. Franco and the Nationalist Party. In searing detail, Picasso's painting, Guernica, 
captures the horrors and anguish of the town's people and animals as the Nazi bombs fell. Fittingly, a mural of Picasso's work now resides in Guernica, a poignant reminder of the atrocities of war that inspired it, a constant call to arms to build a more humane and liberated world. In 2013, after the major earthquake and tsunami that ravaged the east coast of Japan and its people, the Indian artist Anish Kapoor and the Japanese architect Arata Isazaki teamed up to design a large orb-shaped inflatable mobile concert hall. The concert hall is called the Ark Nova, the New Ark. Whereas Noah's Ark in the Old Testament carried people and animals to escape the flood, the Ark Nova, the New Ark, carried music and arts to affected regions of Japan to rebuild community, culture and people's spirits in the aftermath of tragic human loss, grief and devastation. Out of the darkness, the Ark Nova was born, a symbol of resilience, hope, transformation and strength of the human spirit in the face of devastation and darkness. <laughs> and may I thank Anka who helped me with my PowerPoint slides and Nick with the technology. <laughs> thank you. So please help me uh, welcome in the panel here. Uh, we've got uh, Tyrone Wagana on the end, Joanne Dixon, Mary Moore, Stormy Mills, and Lyndon Adams to my right. So Tyrone, seeing as you've got the mic down there, <laughs> you're all ready to go. Uh, would you mind, yeah, telling us a little bit about your work, about the process? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the work I have in this exhibition, yeah, I've got four pieces, uh, two paintings and two sculptural elements. So I got <clears throat> um, a nice place to hate yourself, which is the feature of it. The, you see it everywhere, which is cool. Um, I've got sweet candy or as in like hotel suit. And then I've got uh, Reze Khan, Portal Mouth and the Protector, and then uh, Sedetary, the Cosmic and his children. Um, uh, my process around like my artwork is kind of, mm, I kind of just jump into it. I like saturate myself with images. I'll look up a whole bunch of stuff along on the internet, um, just get on Instagram and just, you know, we're so saturated with the images today. And then I'll just do something, um, just kind of like, it's just it's essentially like smacking my head against the canvas and then whatever pours out is poured out. Um, but yeah, that's about it. <laughs> oh. um, well, my work in the exhibition here, Ted, my beautiful partner of 40 years, um, is actually from my archive. So I did that when I was 19. Um, and so I think people have, because I don't exhibit very much, I think people thought they'd come and see new work. But in actual fact, it's very, very old work. And so a way that I can summarise it very easily is I um, was dyslexic when I was uh, very young and um, way back in the 60s, of course, that was not a good thing. And I left school at 14 and on the day of my 15th birthday, I started Claremont Tech with some wonderful people George Haynes, David Gregson, um, and a lot of people, um, and I was very young. My sister had died in a car accident for uh, six months before that. And so a, a lot of the people in the art school were talking about, we had, I don't know if any of you remember Claremont Tech way back in the early 70s, but they had the Statue of David and whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was all about learning how to draw the world around you. That's what art schools were about. Until this wonderful man called Ross Morrow, um, he was a friend of Brett Whiteley's and had a very big alcohol problem. And he liked me and I was 15, fat, 
of, you know, it's taught me so much um, about everything those days because of all the people that could have succeeded, I would not at that stage be one of the people you would have thought. But anyway, he walked into the room and said, we're not going to talk about or draw about the world around us. We're going to draw about um, what we think about and our ideas. And that has just become my thesis of work for my whole life in the fact that um, I've developed, for 50 years I have enormous skills in how to paint and draw the world around us in serious detail. And I'm very interested in mixing that with an interior world and what those two things look like on a one surface. So these particular drawings are, um, I don't know why I'm so nervous. These particular drawings are about actually very diaristic. There is a bit of a Tracy Emin before Tracy Emin ever, ever, you know, put pen to paper. My sister had died, she had a red rose on her coffin. I was struggling, I thought I was going to die. And it was very diaristic. And the other one in Stormy and Melissa's space, it's got my, one of my first boyfriends in there. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, what I've done since then is whatever work I do, always, whether it's a portrait that I'm commissioned to paint, you know, of an, a very eminent person, I learn a lot about, like, for instance, the Elizabeth Jolly one when I was doing the stories around the frame. You know, some of the images around the frame are a hedge of rosemary because in every house she lived in, she grew a hedge of rosemary to keep the demons out or, or um, you know, the, one of the books was called the, the Pear Tree. And what I find as uh, being lucky to be an artist and to work with an interior world and use that to my advantage, whether it's about sadness or whatever, is that I think artists have, um, uh, we can find our way in the world through charging uh, things like an olive tree or a sunflower or a bird or whatever with enormous meaning and make a, a meta language of our world. And I think on a micro level, if you're talking about art therapy, you can use that in a much, uh, you know, you can tell, um, you can develop languages that actually make sense of the world. And that's what every bit of my work is about creating those, an interior world and the exterior world and how they work together. And so uh, that these works are very, very early. And um, there you go, that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And I would just say as well, um, you know, don't worry about feeling nervous. I don't have to even do anything and I feel nervous well, as well. Yeah. So <laughs> we can all relax here. But thanks for that very insightful discussion. Thank you. Stormy? I'm a painter. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I've always drawn ever since I was a, a small child. That was my... Uh, respite from the world. Um, I liked comics, I liked cartoons, those sorts of things, and I liked drawing people and monsters. Um, then, when I was uh, about 1984, I discovered the New York style of graffiti and trains, and so I went out and started liberating art materials and um, painting on walls. And uh, by 1986, I was a 16-year-old in New York actually looking at trains and meeting some of those kids that were painting those trains. Um, whatever I have done in order to do the necessities of buy food and pay the rent, etc., I've always painted or drawn stuff. So um, I think, yeah, it's kind of like one of those oxygens that I need. So, um, and, and I've always kind of figured that I have these amazing powers of misinterpretation. Um, and, and poor observation skills. So, you know, this is my way of decoding the world and um, making it make sense to me. So in terms of this show and this symposium, it's a really great thing to be involved in. So. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The same as uh, what Stormy just said, other than drawing on trains. That's not, <laughs> not been part of my journey at all. But in, t in terms of the, the um, work for this show, 
Um, this was made as a response to our first lockdown last year. So, you know, a lot of the artists this morning talked about um, having lots of time to paint, lots of time to make work. We found ourselves, the three of us, three of us in, in that collaboration, Nicola Kay, Marcella Palenza, a poet, Nicola's a multimedia artist and I'm a painter who works across media. Um, we didn't have any time to make art. We were online seven or eight hours a day with students, you know. You, you know, I was tethered to my phone because I didn't have NBN for the whole day, so there was that static -y. You know, I've got NBN now, it's fine. But, you know, it was tough, as Nicola was. She didn't have NBN either. We were just trying to keep people engaged for three months. You know, seven hours a day. Most of the people on the other end had no idea what we were doing. They might talk to us once or twice a week. And we knew that. We were really conscious of keeping people awake, alive. You know, we knew there was going to be depression and people were going to be incredibly isolated. We were incredibly isolated as well. Nicola was also doing it with two young children and, and her partner, etc. We all had, we were isolated from our families, Marcella as well. So we started this conversation when we did finally come together in real space and we talked about all of the things we had experienced that were so very, very difficult. And for me, I can't talk for Nicola or Marcella, but I think it was my saviour in my mental health mm. because it had been such a difficult three months of just having you know, nothing or being online, basically. So, you know, they're, they're the unspoken, the unseen, the interstitial, the palimpsested conversations that keep running through both the works in this exhibition. You know, from a very privileged space, and I, I really acknowledge that, but beside that, it was about us trying to help other people's mental health at the detriment of our own. But I think the work liberated us from, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Somehow from actually going under in that time. So that's what the work's about. You can keep that one. Oh, I can keep it. It's mine. Thank you, Mendel. Sure. It's, it's been a really interesting time to reflect, I think, on um, the duality as we're talking this afternoon about the dark side of the arts. And uh, I've been really interested, given that um, seemingly this idea of transformation or some sort of processing that's involved with creating art, in whatever medium it might be, has really been a through line of what everyone's been discussing. And the way that that might juxtapose with, I guess, something that you were alluding to there, Stormy, about um, having, you know, you've got external pressures as well, like having food on the table, or you've got, uh, as the earlier panel discussed, you know, um, all of these pressures externally about what your work might need to be or, or how it's going to be received and all those kind of things. So I'm interested if each of you could perhaps talk a little bit about um, if you have and again, you've sort of been alluding to this idea of the studio and how that's a kind of safe space. If there are strategies or approaches that each of you have taken to ensure that you have that mental clarity or that distance so that you can do your processing or do your creation without necessarily uh, experiencing as much of that external dark side pressure where you're feeling you know, those, those things that might be getting in the way of you being able to do that, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Should I start this end? If this end this time. Um, the studio for me is my own space, um, and right through my career, I have quite a few children, but the studio has always been the centre of the house, and the children have never been allowed in it because I'm an oil painter, not because I don't want them in the studio, but oh, but it's quite toxic. <laughs> <laughs> so, keeping them out. Um, the poodle was allowed in. And she never wrecked. She never wrecked anything, but the kids always did. So that's you know that that space. You know, I made some work around out of the book, a room of one's own, uh, the Virginia Virginia Wolf. I pulled it apart and made my own works about that. So it's always been a really important part of my world. And I think um, you know, I think I was a better person and a better parent 
because I had that space, I think I probably would have killed all five of them otherwise. <laughs> Me, if you like. Um, I'm really, yeah, similar. I'm very lucky. I have a, a great studio space and I've been there for quite a lot of years now. Um, and it is I, like a, it's my sanctuary. Um, even if I'm not really getting any work done, I'm always doing something in there. So it feels like I'm um, yeah, exercising demons as I tidy up even. Um, but yeah, but it took me a long time to get used to having a studio and having a studio space because I just used to draw wherever and, and I was out painting walls at night. So, you know, the landscape, I was part of the landscape was my studio. So. Um, yeah, it's, I am really grateful for having that space now and, and do feel very fortunate because I'm able to go somewhere and make paintings, make a mess and yeah, have successes and failures in private. So. Before you move on, could you tell us a little bit about the, the, the feeling or of successes and failures and is there, is there a way that you keep those things in perspective when you're working on your own like that? Um. I, li I like to torture myself <laughs> um, by trying to invent new ways of doing things um, and learning processes and so I have experimented with oils. Um, a friend of ours, Matt Doust, was really instrumental in pushing me into that medium. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, the, the studio space is... Um, yeah, we, when, you, when you're making a painting, um, I, I don't know, sometimes there's a plan, sometimes there's a good sketch, and sometimes it's best to just start painting. Um, and you don't, they don't necessarily always have to be like completely resolved, but they'll lead somewhere. And so, um, yeah, those naturally occurring disasters in work always become kind of accumulative. It's, it's like incremental circles and then quantum leaps and then going back to the beginning again. So, um, yeah, and I think that for artists, you know, the idea of creating a whole body of work and then putting them in, into an exhibition is really exposing. Um, yeah, like standing naked in a room full of people. But you're not the model. Um, so, yeah, we, we do, oh, well, I feel that we do torture ourselves quite considerably in that. But, you know, as much as we're all kind of, like Mary said, she's nervous, I'm nervous. We're all sitting here nervously <laughs> twittering away. Um, but, you know, we're actually really fucking brave because we're doing things that a lot of other people would like to do. And, and we'd, I think all of us would encourage them to do so. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, maybe I'm not so nervous now. Um, <laughs> I've got two studios, one at home, um, and then 20 years ago I um, have, we have a beautiful studio away from home. And I don't, um, yeah, I mean, it's a privileged life. I mean, you have to just say it's a privilege to be able to your job is to be a painter but you know on days when it's really good you cannot think that there is anything better than the day you've just had and on days when it's not so good it's really isolating it's lonely you're without people around you you don't have someone to go um oh, let's have a coffee or i mean i never have a coffee with anyone from month to month you know i um you know, so I mean, it has its good days and its bad days, but I don't tend to look on the fact that um, I work on paintings, I work on projects, and um, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm blessed, I think, with a very high effort reward um, ratio, which means that if it's not actually difficult to do, I'm actually not very interested in doing it, and I can wait a very, very long time. So they're very project. Um, effort reward based and really if you have a look at why that might be is I don't have any children we don't have any children living at home but when you're doing really quick spontaneous work you have to have a lot of time because there's a big culling process in that because big spontaneous work you have to throw half of it away because most of it's no good whereas with process driven work like layers and layers and 
uh, process driven. You can go in, achieve layers and tasks, whatever, and build it up slowly. And so that's how my work has developed the way it is, in that it's, it's very time consuming. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know where we're talking. I feel as I'm talking about myself as an artist now, rather than talking about what the theme of this is, which is mental health. But it's, um, you know, it definitely has some hard days being an artist. It's not a, um, a very glamorous, Thing at all a lot of the time. It's, it's hard work. So, and very, very rewarding. So, uh, I'm just lucky because I feel as though um, my life has great meaning because of what uh, um, issues that I engage with in my work. And they're highly personalised, but I think that they're relatable to other people if I was to talk about them. People would. Um, in a way, there's some universal sense to them as well. But um, yeah, I think I'm I'm very lucky. But I do use a very interior uh, way of collecting metaphors um, to make my work often. Also, the portraits they're engaging with people, and that's in a whole other level. But um, yeah, I mean that that's all I've got to say. And I'm probably nervous too. <laughs> Um, just to make a couple of comments from a psychological perspective, just what you shared, Mary, I, um, again, going back to the talk, really, because you're striving and towards something that's meaningful and you're building on that each day from what you, if I understand you correctly, that that in itself is actually strongly associated with your mental health because it is leading towards what is meaningful mm. to you. Um, the other thing I heard too um, in, the, in response to the question around artists have to live and yet you've got this passion of doing art um, and I think a f couple of you at least talked about that protective space. Um, you know when I talked about motivational conflicts what we've found is when people are sort of paralysed with that, it does give rise to distress. But what I could hear in what you were sharing is there's obviously a passion and a love for the art. Yes, you have to live and do what you need to do to live, but there is a priority there already and you are finding ways to protect that and have, I think um, Ted referred to the word, word earlier around a structure, you know, and creating that sacred space that you can go to. So I think all of those things are related to maintaining a sense of well-being. And it's directed as well, you know, when I said, um, like, having that protected space, sacred space for your art is, I get the sense when I listen to you as well, is it's going to that place that is authentic to each of you. Um, which is just very good for your well-being. So, hi, Ray. Um, I, my studio is kind of like um, severance from reality in any shape of the form. Um, just because, like, um, it's where I like freely express myself. Um, but yeah, it's like a kind of on like a spaceship sometimes, and um, not even on earth um you know <laughs> you know i start at like i'll get into my studio at like five o'clock in the morning and um you know have a, a couple mini breakdowns and then have a couple coffees and then finally start doing something but yeah it's it's an interesting process uh prior to that like um where art happened um was always in the house so it was always at kitchen tables in the backyard um i've grown up pretty i guess monetarily poor um people use art as a way of um, uh, passing the time and expressing ourselves and also being Aboriginal, like, it's ingrained in our culture, so eventually you're going to do it at some point. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Sari. Joe, I was interested in just picking up on um, a, a thread that you picked up from Mary as well about um, the, the idea of challenge or the the difficulty of a task and the time that's involved and the the intrinsic kind of reward that comes from that and you were alluding to in your presentation 
um, the potential utility of, of art making for people in the community as well. And I guess if that's a theme of our mental health discussion too, you know, how crucial do you see that those aspects at a time where a lot of people, um, you know, earlier today were also alluding to the idea that we feel like we're busy all the time, we're doing so many different things and we've kind of got this attention span that's being chopped up left, right and centre. You know, how much value would you place on that as something when we're thinking about translating these findings into the, into the broader community as well? I think, again, I think the artist has a huge critique to offer to our society because probably what you're picking up with, um, you know, everything has to happen instantly and um, demand-driven sort of society. So when I talked about the approach focused and driven, um, when I was reflecting on my own work, I thought I think as a society, we're very driven by that and performances and rewards um, so I think for the arts and the artists to somehow remind the society of what it is to be fully human, um, what it is to really flourish, um, and to offer a critique to the sort of um, being in on, on the rat race and constantly having to tick off boxes. Um, I think the arts keep a society in balance and really offer a huge gift, really. Um. Thank you. Uh, should we open it up for some questions, intro panel questions? Has anyone on the panel got any questions for anyone else on the panel? I've got one for you. For me? Yeah. <laughs> so so what, what you don't know about Nick is he's an incredible musician. And so, um, you know, he's the missing link on the panel to talk about um, the gig economy and the, or the lack of it during the last couple of years. And have you got any comments around that that you'd really like to share? How hard was it for you? You're also um, autoimmune something or other. Yes. It's quite a lot of information at once. <laughs> um, <laughs> so which so the gig economy in terms of or since both. since COVID yeah. or. Yeah. Well, you can talk about your PhD, but that's a much longer time span. Yeah, I'll probably yeah. pass out if I think about it too hard. Um, well, I mean, part of my question for the panel earlier was sort of prompted by reflections on that. So, I mean, you know, obviously I'm not working in a visual medium, but as a composer. So I'm a bass player um, and a freelance musician, I guess by trade, if we're going to call it that. But my passion is for writing music and, uh, and creating art, I guess. So uh, the idea of work being transformative or that's something that I didn't realise until more recently was an essential part of my compositional process. So the, the music that I wrote on a recent album, you know, covered themes about, you know, isolation from family who live in the eastern states, um, you know, the loss of loved ones, uh, kind of all sorts of transformative things that I, you know, have found really difficult to manage emotionally over a number of years and so that, that work kind of was... Um, yeah, it's just hugely liberating and, and, and sort of in a weird way exciting to actually process and to, to be able to have something to focus on and to sit down and create art that maybe people can enjoy, but even if not, it was very valuable for me. But the flip side of that was trying to do those things in, in the gig economy where I guess, you know, like most people and probably in other industries as well, we have portfolio careers where we're doing some freelance performing, we're doing some teaching, some people might be working other jobs as well. There are commercial pressures, there are personal or interpersonal pressures and toxic aspects to the scene, not the oil paints, but just other toxicities, um, that, that I found would really infiltrate into my personal space and especially when I was trying to compose. You know, if we're thinking about, uh, Joe, what you're talking about, the um, approach idea and being at the bottom of the, <laughs> of the grid, of wanting to be up there but being at the bottom and finding that enormously depressing. So, yeah, it's really interesting to me to talk to other artists and see, you know, how psychologically people manage that divide between our ideal and our idealistic place of we can compose and we can write or draw or paint or whatever it might be and, and exercise these demons or process these ideas versus the reality that this thing needs to be done at a certain point and we've got to kind of get things done. And so... Um, and, and, you know, all those other pressures. So that's, yeah, something I'm certainly interested in. And, and it is a, like, the COVID-19 time was, the lockdown was really fascinating for me because 
um, like I think like everyone's kind of alluded to, it actually was pretty awesome in some ways to, sorry, not to minimise the tragedy of the pandemic, of course, but in terms of the time that we had to, to be separate from some of those things and to say, okay, well, we can't even worry about them now, just to have the time to investigate yourself a bit more fully and to write new music or to compose and do those sort of things um, has a lot of value in it. Uh, probably a bit off topic, but it makes me think about universal basic income for artists. But um, yeah, so since then it's been interesting too because the um, you know the gigs have rebounded in a certain way, but it's also going to have changed for forever as well. So just thinking about how we're going to manage those things in an already fairly precarious industry is something that's worth further consideration. Is that enough for you? Okay, thank you. I'm not the focus, but... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I wanted to say is that I'm not so nervous now at all, but I'm really good in my own studio talking about my work because I've got my work around me. So I feel as I've been really self-indulgent just talking about, you know, my nice studio and, uh, and whatever. I basically um, am very passionate about this and living with Ted for so many years and watching what he's done all of for the past 45 years and that is that it's you know I've got off, off track a bit because sometimes we're talking about artists you know the, the dark side or just generally being an artist but they cross over here and that is that artists need people around them mm -hmm. because I've got a beautiful studio and I make some fabulous work and I need people around me to go I get that or I want one or whatever. It's no point in actually just isolating yourself off and having the life of an artist. It's, you really need help. And so I've watched Ted give lots and lots of opportunities to people for so many years, like every little increment or new thing, like a show like this is, you know, I mean, there's been 11 things in the press. I mean, it makes artists visible. So. When you're talking about people like the lady who works at Dada, everybody needs someone, because I was talking earlier on of being 15 and this wonderful man called Ross Morrow who had a really big impact on my life. Everybody really needs to help everyone at a different level of where they are. So, um, yeah, and you know, the art scene in Perth is just so abysmal. And Ted came in the other day with a half the page with a footballer and said, wouldn't it be great if we could get the West Australian to print a West Australian artist's work here so that you could pin it up on the wall? And in the COVID time when they were stopping, you know, they were concerned about sports and what was going to happen, but sports weren't going to be played. And one man on the radio said, it's not really that sports aren't being played, it's that the community around sport is what's so important about sport. And it's the community around being an artist which is what's important about being an artist, that it services the community. Even if you're not an artist, people can find some response or relief or find themselves in the art. I mean, it's a much more inclusive thing. And we live in a city that is so barren from helping people, helping younger people, older people, helping mid-career people. Um, it's a very isolating thing. And really, we need to... Um, help each other. And, you know, I mean, the one thing, you know, there are two things, because we all work as artists and revel, revel in our isolation and privilege of what it's like to be in a closed studio that we have control of. But people like Dada are getting people out of their isolated homes and putting them in a place where they can connect with people. And so, you know, artists need to go and work down with Dada and help them and then we need people to be kinder and more generous in our community to help artists of, of eminence to move forward you know it's just generally a generosity thing that needs to um, open it all up for people that need to work because it's going to really help their mental health issues in finding a way that they can externalize something or just a more developed, uh, you know, someone like me who, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not lost here, but I, you know, don't know where to go from here. But um, yeah, I don't want to leave here just after just having 
just spoken about what my life in my studio is like because it's very quiet. Yes. And really, the bigger picture is events like this and people talking and helping each other and, um, yeah, ex you know, helping each other. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, respond to that one. Yeah. I think that um, the, the loss of so many galleries in Perth has been a, a, a really um, devastating. But, you know, when it, what we do at ECU galleries or what we try and do is do try and develop that kind of community around the arts, which is slowly happening. It's lovely to be partnering with, with other galleries, with There Is, to keep growing that and having Ted on board in the, in the galleries is great because it has been really tough, you know, to, to get the galleries open and keep them opening. We've had two shutdowns this year and we were shut down for a long time last year. And it's a, an enormous amount of work for art workers that's, uns again, unseen and unheard. You know, you guys keeping your gallery open, you haven't even talked about that. Mm. You know, so I think that I, I totally agree with you. I think that's part of the mental health of our arts community, to actually be more generous and open. And, you know, what we've done is waiver fees, both last year and this year, thanks to Clive, who has agreed to that, for all of both galleries, for early, mid and established artists so I think I can only agree really it's really a statement rather than adding anything thank you I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking about the I guess the the impact and the sharing of art we've got a question here from um, Sydney uh, for the panel so uh, our caller has asked as artists art can be a way that we process our internal life, but of course it can also provide solace or reflection for our, for our audiences. Has anyone on the panel received feedback from someone who has uh, seen their work, who said it really struck a chord with them or helped them? Uh, how did that make you feel, if so? Oh, actually, sorry, I think you gotta take that one. I can answer that with a good example. Um, this is all a bit like lessons in how to paint yourself out of a corner. Um, I had an exhibition in Melbourne a few years ago and there were two guys standing in front of one of my paintings and they just started, total strangers, they started talking to each other about it. Um, I'd had conversations with them prior to this um, where they'd shared some very personal things that they, they were going through or their family was going through, their struggles. And they were standing in front of this painting and they just started talking about it and they started to share these snippets of information about their lives. And I was, you know, pretty pleased with myself that I'd made a painting that had connected to complete strangers. Um, and it, you know, that it is a powerful thing. The, the analogy about sport and, and art and is a really interesting one as well because it is true that the community that go to see a football match and that they sing songs and chant and all, all the things that they, I've never been to one, so I don't, I'm just guessing. Um, <laughs> the things that they do, you know, it's that collective, yep. like they've shared that experience, it's shared experience, like going to a concert. I've been to a few concerts, so a concert's a better analogy for me. Um, they have all that shared experience and then you lose a gallery mm. and you lose that audience and that small, quiet time that we have in our studio making these works, you've suddenly got no one to share mm. all that stuff with. And it, it is very sad that, you know, that galleries aren't funded and subsidised and helped in a, in a greater way because we've got all these people that are all, in, particularly in a pandemic, when we're all lockdown when we all can't leave we can turn the kitchen table into a studio lots of people could be making up but where do they go with that afterwards so um, yeah. sorry for giving too much away about what happens in our home but we watch and analyze university ads about what they're trying to sell shampoo or an education or whatever but we've also watched I won't mention it because I keep on forgetting there's a screen over there, but our national broadcaster has made a new arts program. Mm. Now it is so quick moving, it's so fast, it's so whiz-bang, 
it's all about the top surface of art. And Ted and I have been discussing, or Ted especially, about what would it be like to once a week or every night after the news have a five minute look at inside a writer's home, their desk or their music studio or whatever. So people could see what a, an amazing, rich, rewarding life that people could relate to. We're only ever seeing what happened to the exhibition opening. We're never actually seeing the ordinariness of where wonderful things are made and how things are made in really interesting spaces that could be and yet their lives are incredibly meaningful and rewarding because a lot of people don't want to watch sport. Mm. You know, and so what they've, they've got is a program about the top glitzy layer of art rather than how it's made and who makes it and, that, that, and, and how great it is. So there's some of the things that, um, that we talk about, just about, especially what you do, Storm, you know, what you were talking about in Western Australia, how do you, you know, if, if you don't have a curator from a, the gallery coming to you, there are no gallerists who are going, yes, look, we're so busy, but we'll fit an exhibition in for you once every three years. So it needs sort of like this enthusiasm, and we need to start complaining and helping each other about how to make our life for young people better, you know, young students better and people at school and their, you know, um, because being an artist is really hard and you need lots of help mm. along the way. Um, uh, ben, that's all I've got to say. There you go. <laughs> the TV program of you. <laughs> um, I think my artwork are kind of does provide insights because it is, I guess, about life and living and how you feel day to day about, uh, you know, monotonous stuff. But I don't, I don't know if my artwork's ever touched someone in a profound way. I've never been told that before. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> so uh, perhaps we'll open uh, up to the floor for some questions if anyone's uh, got anything they'd like to ask of the panelists at the moment. Yes. I noticed during the lockdown, I noticed during the lockdown, you know, the early on one, you know, um, as we know, there was the government gave out money to, uh, what do they call it, a COVID payment for people that had lost their jobs. What was very interesting about that, you know, um, looking at social media, Twitter and things, people were complaining about, because uh, you know, there was a lot of us said, well, what about artists, blah, 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 and then you get a response saying, but they don't, you know, they're not essential services and blah, blah. I thought, hang on a minute. You watch Netflix, you read books, you listen to music. While you're in lockdown, you're watching all this stuff, you're doing all this stuff. They don't, uh, by that time, museums, and uh, they put plays on, Shakespeare plays and stuff, and people, I thought, there's something wrong with it, the, the value system we have. So I just want to ask the panel, how do you think you can get round that kind of value system? And it's thinking, you know. Anyone else? <laughs> I'll have a crack. Um, I don't think you can get around systems like that. They've, they've been designed and created and built that way to maintain a status quo. Um, so you have to um, think creatively um, and be more of a, a re rebellious nature or an anarchist or whatever it is to destroy that system and then bring about a better one. Um, and that, you know, that could be as simple as writing a political statement on a wall or creating a body of work or a performance or any of those kinds of things and you know that is probably why historically artists have been considered um, dangerous because um, if they have that bent where they have uh, or they feel that they are part of something that keeps the uh, the morals of society to account, um, yeah, somebody that's telling you that you don't belong to that society is obviously in fear of you. So, um, yeah, 
just do more of it. Um, I think one of the things that I've been thinking about for a while, again with my collaborators, is is about it, uh, public arts and you know, with galleries shutting constantly, I think we have to find new ways of taking art to the public. Do you know, and what that means, I'm not sure yet. We're still working on it, but a part of that I think is really important because what you talked about was people not being able to go to art, whereas if we have it in public places in a different manifestation than it is now, you know, I like I love seeing Stormy's work all over the city. You know, but those those are funded projects. Yeah. Self-funded. Yeah, self-funded or funded pro. You know, that take. You know, how do artists who aren't paid through it, that through pandemics? How do we take those things out and put them in the public places? Because I think that's one of the ways we can rebel. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know about the, have you seen that Calamunda nest? No. Well, I'm assuming it's a guy. I'm not sure that it's a guy. I don't know who made them, but there's somebody that was making these huge nests and putting them in public spaces in Kalamunda, and the community loved them. They really got behind. They were done. They were executed really well, and they were placed in. Uh, great positions and they were placed under the cover of darkness and you know like the community got to such so enamored with them and finding them that you know it was public art it was completely illegal but nobody removed or destroyed them so that you know it's a great example of this is a system and this is the way of doing it and they completely circumvented that and you know we have these cities that are you know supposed to be designed for people and but really, they're just easy to clean, yeah. um, you know. And it, they're soulless. You, you know, there was an article in the paper the other day, uh, or somebody had written an article. I read it. I don't read the paper. Um, the about how bad uh, the city of Perth, like the city centre itself, has become. And it's such a soulless, degrading space. And it's being obviously it's being used by people that really do need somewhere to live. Um, and, and that's a great thing, but there should be better things for those people as well. But they're using those spaces because they're so soulless and no one cares. So no one cares about this space, then no one cares that I can sleep here. But at the same time, it should be that no one cares about this space so I can make art here. No? Thanks for your comments. Um, which I yeah, strongly agree with too. Uh, I wonder if one way forward is, at least in terms of mental health, there seems to be an awakening around the importance of mental health in the community and the government is starting to pour money into mental health, mental health research. I just think maybe one of the challenges for the arts is to do what you're doing today, which is where you're bringing the two together um, and highlighting the impact of the arts for mental health and well-being, and maybe more of that. I, I think today's initiative is fantastic, but maybe more of that <coughs> needs to happen. And the other benefit of that is it really helps to destigmatise mental health, um, and we're still on a journey with that. Um, so that would be one way forward, I think. Um, you know, you can all get together and go over there and put yourself together a, a program or project where you can join the Mental Health Thems Conference, it's called. It's an international conference and they have people from all over the world. You know, and I'm looking at all the things that have gone on today and all the beautiful uh, insights, everybody, oh, I hate that word, but um, it's always used in mental health. Oh. They've got insight. No, they haven't got insight. Any case, try and get something together from the from this organisation ECU and present something there because it's a good idea. Just, um, I just think it's, it's to that, that idea of the 
television program, which, thank you. The idea of the television program looking inside an artist's life, and but also going a little deeper as well, and looking at the vulnerabilities of an artist and and how mental health plays out in these private spaces and the the struggle of of going. And it was like the last panel as well about lecturing, and and I think the greatest connection is when there's that that power imbalance is is addressed and people are not put on pedestals or inaccessible inaccessible and so but speaking about uh, lived experience mental health in in forums like this um, in lecture theatres which I know is difficult because you've got to stick to that bloody curriculum but that's a space to connect. I've just finished a degree and the, the lecturers and the people that I connect with the greatest are the ones who have shared their lived experience and their vulnerabilities and their insecurities around things. Then my ears prick up and I'm able to listen a lot greater and hear. Um, that's why I really enjoyed the beginning when you shared a little bit about, about yourself and that beautiful private space and what that means for you. But I think that's a really good way to um, get into the people's homes. That television show is a really good idea. I know. I'm excited well, about Ted, that. You know, Ted, that should be terrific. Yeah, I mean, it was someone many years ago, like 30 years ago, came to my studio and made a film and he said, this is just so um, incredible because it's so ordinary. You've got yoga containers for your paint and this and that. And, you know, I kept on thinking what a great thing that was and, and Ted and I have used to show a lot of videos when we used to teach way back in the 80s and just to see people's environments and you know me painting Elizabeth Jolly and painting the chair that she wrote in everything's so ordinary and so available and the the biggest thing I think is that we just see the end things of the the celebrity and the glamour of successful artists but the most important thing that you can do is to get people to do it you know, to get people to start making things and get off the phone and 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 start sort of um, just making things and having people helping them make things, you know, and I don't know where it starts because, I mean, if you're at school now, Ted's working, sorry, this is an out on Ted, but he's working with the Churchlands to try and develop, you know, the, the strength of their art students at, at Churchlands. And then they go to art school. What, what happens after art school? Who's going to pick them up? And what, what do their parents think about what they're doing? And is there ever going to be any money in it? But if, you know, if, we, if it's visible and it's respected, like um, in France, the Macron was talking about, you know, after the coronavirus, which they've really suffered from, what we have to really mend is our art of living our, our, you know, our culture, and way at the end came sports. Well, I mean, we don't even open the paper until we get two pages of sport or furniture. Mm. You know, and what we need to do is I insist in some way or the other that we're going to be, uh, we're going to make things and support people, and um, I don't know how to do it, but, you know, kids are, kids are really struggling. They really need avenues to make things and learn how to tell their stories and be active in a world that's not on the screen. So, you know, I'm, I read a lot about this and I think that, um, yeah, it all comes to back to teaching. There needs to be a lot of emphasis on teaching and parting with what you can do to help people. And then at all stages. So there you go. You look like you want to say something. No. <laughs> I'm going to hide under the table to ask this question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm really embarrassed, but I'm going to go there. Um, there's an idea I've been bringing in my head for a while, and you guys, everyone in this room is really inspiring me and giving me the courage to ask this. So here I go. Are there any artists in this room that would give me, let me into their studio for five minutes? And if so, can I have your contact details? <laughs> because, I will. because I, you know, I've been talking to a few people about this thing, mm -hmm. you know, everything about this mental health, um, where we're where we're at, what everyone's feeling, and I really think there's a need for something around grassroots, celebrating WA and all this uniqueness and brilliance that we have. And I think, 
just bringing you know the spaces we're talking about studio spaces i think there's a really opportunity and we we need to do it we need to make it happen um so mary thank you for your hand up <laughs> thank you just for, just for context for people who don't know you could you tell us a little bit about about um <laughs> okay. Are you a video, video maker or something? Are you proposing sort of videos or something along yeah, those lines? Um, my initial ideas around this were was um, around art and just creativity and yep. the process of making. So, sorry, I have to face this way because I'm bouncing. Um, the whole process of making and just opening up that door of um, inspiration for generations and bringing it into people's homes. So, um, video, oh, it could be processed, because not, not everyone likes to be videoed. So, it, you know, it doesn't have to involve the person, it can just be at the how-tos, but it's just um, sharing that with um, the broader. Yes, and um, Lyndall suggested that you could send your email through to the galleries and uh, they can put you in contact with some people as well. Just as an add-on to what Mary was saying, um, and I'd love to hear your response to this as well. I mean, I feel, from a teacher background, so I'm an ex-art teacher of 23 years, um, I feel that the education system is really what needs re-education. And so teachers are at wit their wit's end trying to be heard and for the visual arts to be heard. And we also need to re-educate our parents because we have very passionate students who want to do art, but by the time they hit year 11 and 12, their parents won't let them. Because what will they become if they do art? Whereas if you do maths or if you do English, do our parents really expect their, their child to be a mathematician or an art his or an English <coughs> writer? No. Mm. So why can't we see art as being something that's just as integral to the students and to their ongoing lifelong learning? So I feel that's probably an area where we need to start and I don't know how to do that and I know many teachers that would just so love to have the support from the parents as well to say, look, my, my subject is just as important as maths. Yeah. Just to add to that, I think um, one thing I was surprised about when my own children were going through high school is how many normal run-of-the-mill kids had anxiety disorder. And I think it's a directly proportionate to the way that in primary school, NAPLAN has kind of push not just visual art, but music, um, drama, the arts, um, is how you learn about yourself and, and who you are as a person. And the education system has kind of got less and less artistic. I mean, if I compare the art I did in primary school compared to my children, I probably did three times as much art as they did my, I've got little nieces and nephews now that are doing half as much as my kids did. So it's getting worse and worse and I don't, I, I agree with you completely. I was, I was just going to, sorry, I was just going to add something on to that. Well, if I, I went to a school a couple of weeks or about a month ago in Coogee that's a whole school uh, full of students that the education system is, has failed. They're, it's their last chance kind of a school for these kids. And I did a workshop where I showed them a whole pile of sketchbooks over different years and we talked about drawing and collecting and writing notes and all this sort of stuff. And they all got given a sketchbook at the, at the end of that that they would hopefully create a draw or collect or stick things, do whatever they choose to do with them. It will contribute to their end of year result and hopefully as a result of that they'll pass that class but it's not it's doing something creatively not the way a school has traditionally done stuff yeah just to add something else
But also when a school needs to, when a school has visitors come to the school and they need to show it off, what do they do? Can we have a music performance set up in that corner? Let's put all the art up. They don't want to see maths classes and, and those kinds of subjects, do they? They're showing off the arts. So it obviously is important, isn't it? But how do we value that? How do we show the value of our students learning these subjects? I'm just adding to these two women, because um, my kids are a little bit younger, even though I should be grandma age, but I am grandma age. <laughs> I still have 11 year old, and we need to choose in our public schools now which creative expert we're gonna get. So there's so many more fewer positions for visual artist, drama teacher. So for instance, we had the choice, are we gonna have a drama instructor or a language, right? And there's no option for a music one or, yeah. So we have a music and a drama, but no art. And so anyways, that is the public education system now. <laughs> but how do we change that? And then I think, you know, I've been really um, uh, distressed by, yeah, the School of Arts and Humanities at universities, the culling of that in this past year. So um, I'm always looking for ways to try to help those situations and create opportunities. So I think we might have, what have we got, one or so, one minute to go today. So if we got time for a quick little question, if anyone's got anything that they would like to add or any last minute questions for any of the panelists, we'd love to hear from you. And if we've got a government that's neoliberal, you know, and they don't, they, they couldn't give us stuff about the arts, quite frankly, they've cut, 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 cut over the years. I think until we can get the government, not to do it, but to have a different set of values, we've got to be, artists, all you artists out there, have got to start opening up your studios, um, bringing, making ABC program, oh, doesn't matter which ones, but programs, you know, about the arts and about the funding, and try and link it up with mental health, work along mental health pra with practitioners, work along with public health systems and disability, because I think what's happened to government is they work in silos, and until we have a whole of uh, government approach to things, you know, you get, uh, one government department making a decision and the other one doesn't know about it, but it, that decision affects that department and it affects all our lives, both mentally, emotionally, physically, everything. So you artists out there have got to get to the government. Yeah, and I think, you know, something that struck me from these conversations here at the end is you know, I think it, uh, critical th the type of critical thinking and creative thinking that comes from doing any kind of art practice is just so integral to so many facets of society. And we really, you know, even if you want to be an engineer or an architect or something like that, how do you do that without having critical or creative thinking skills? And I think that overemphasis that we have on easily quantifiable grades, you know, did you solve that equation or not, great. That doesn't promote any of those assets that students need for when they're growing up um, and trying to be, I mean, e even to achieve the supposed aims that the government's looking for for those types of students. So it's, it's quite a short-sighted view, I think, and that's something that we do need to campaign about and, um, and find ways of, yeah, expressing in a, in a way that encourages the, the arts, you know, and, and what we're trying to do here. So I think uh, that if no one's got any other little bits and pieces, I think that might bring us to the end of proceedings for today. So just um, please help me give a big thank you to all the panelists that we've heard from today and all the wonderful art they've created um, and to Lyndall and Ted for putting this on and for ECU for hosting us. So thank you very much. <laughs>